Uh, welcome to the fifth hearing of the committee's inquiry into the proposed aerial shooting of Brumbies in Kosciuszko National Park. I acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians on the land on which we are meeting today. I pay my respects to elders past and present and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal peoples and their ongoing cultures and connections to the land and waters of New South Wales. I also acknowledge and pay my respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us today. My name is Emma Hurst and I am Chair of the Committee. I ask everyone in the room to please turn their mobile phones to silent. Parliamentary privilege applies to witnesses in relation to the evidence they give today. However, it does not apply to what witnesses say outside of the hearing. I urge witnesses to be careful about making comments to the media or to others after completing their evidence. In addition, the Legislative Council has adopted rules to provide procedural fairness for inquiry participants. I encourage committee members and witnesses to be mindful of these procedures. Uh, welcome to our first witnesses for today and thank you for making the time to give evidence. Mr Wilkie, I remind you, you do not need to be sworn in um, as you've been sworn at an earlier hearing for this committee. Ms Jurd, could I please ask you to state your name and position title and swear either an oath or an affirmation? Yes, my name is Catherine Jurd. I'm the RSPCA General Counsel. I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Um, would either of you like to make a short opening statement? Yes, please. Thank you and good afternoon, Chair and Committee members. Managing animal populations can be complex and contentious. Ideally, no wild animals would be interfered with or killed. Various methods have been considered and implemented with insufficient success over the years. The ideal method would be aerially deployed single action contraceptive control. However, current contraceptive technologies cannot manage large horse populations. Other non-lethal methods, such as trapping and rehoming, are logistically challenging and cause their own animal welfare compromises. We rehome up to 200 horses annually, with an average stay of around 270 days before adoption. This does not indicate a marketplace demanding thousands of brumbies. Ground shooting can provide a quick death, but is not adequate to manage the vast numbers of horses identified in Kosciuszko National Park and brings other issues. When this inquiry commenced, it was suggested the wild horse population in Kosciuszko had already fallen below 3,000. Such conclusions are like, unlikely to be persuasive now, with many thousand more horses having been removed in the park over the last 12 months. Both major parties of government have repeatedly identified aerial culling as the most capable method of achieving the required population reduction. While it is not perfect, it is currently necessary due to the scale of the problem and the ineffectiveness of other methods. When conducted properly, it can be an effective and appropriate population reduction strategy where others have failed. Unfortunately, some who do not accept this view have attempted to make RSPCA NSW a political target. Our position is based on extensive research and observations which indicate that aerial culling can be an effective and humane management tool when conducted by trained and experienced personnel and subject to mandatory legislative and procedural standards. We have presented a policy agreed upon by Australia's nine independent RSPCA organisations as a federated body. Our views and advice on aerial culling have been consistent for many years and align with organisations like the Australian Veterinary Association, the CSIRO and academics from well-regarded Australian universities. We provided the same advice to the Liberal National Government as we have to the Labor Government since their election. Allegations that we've chosen to take this position based on political preference or for government funding are untrue and unsubstantiated. Our inspectorate and law enforcement personnel have also been targeted inappropriately. Every investigation provides a learning opportunity before the next, and we never say we are perfect. However, we strongly support every inspector in the field and their work in challenging circumstances. It is not right to cherry pick and use one investigation to determine performance without conducting the same analysis for the many tens of thousands of investigations they conduct every year. RSPCA NSW has operated Australia's largest animal welfare law enforcement agency for over 90 years. In recognition of the state's reliance on this important service for the community, the government provided $20.5 million to the inspectorate for FY23-24. Thanks to this investment and the incredible work of our team, we have arguably delivered the state's most significant 12-month improvement to animal welfare law enforcement outcomes since the introduction of POCTA in 78. Our total operations increased by 32% from 65.8 to 86.9 million. 
Animals rescued by inspectors from cruelty and neglect more than doubled, increasing 124%, and 24 unwritten directions have increased by 55%. Community programs help 65% more people and 89% more animals. Targeted cost of living relief through our Access to Vet Care program help 53% more animals and 36% more families. Education programs taught 46% more children and reached 45% more schools. Animal cruelty allegations and investigations have surged over the same time. Calls taken have increased 22%, cruelty complaints have increased 55% and cruelty investigations have increased 26%. Demand for animal rehoming services has also increased dramatically, with our animal surrender wait list surging 161% from March to June this year. The state budget currently allocates $21 million for various animal welfare groups and objectives despite reforms relying on us more than ever. Our staff and operational costs are $88.5 million this financial year. Without continued government support to maintain our expanded operations, we'll be forced to rapidly reduce our costs below $65 million. We do not want to have to do this. We want the phenomenal animal welfare improvement outcomes delivered last financial year to continue. We trust the Animal Welfare Committee shares that desire and recommends the government funding that meaningfully contributes to our operations. This will ensure that RSPCA and SW can continue to provide an end-to-end -end solution for animal welfare. We always do our best with limited resources. Every member, supporter, donor, volunteer, foster carer and staff member works tirelessly to ensure that every incent delivers the best results for the animals most in need. We provide excellent value for money compared to government agencies. I'm proud of the results over the last 12 months and I am ambitious for the next 12 months. <coughs> RSPCA and SW has been involved in the government's horse management program by providing advice on animal welfare, responding to complaints and proactively monitoring the program to ensure <coughs> compliance with animal welfare regulations. We do not make the laws. We enforce POCTA as the Parliament sets and advocate for reforms that reflect community expectations and improve animal welfare. We maintain our independence and investigate any reports of cruelty or inhumane practices by the government, National Parks and Wildlife or their contractors. Allegations of cruelty will be investigated and inspectors are well placed to use the powers granted to them under POCTA to respond appropriately. Evidence of cruelty will lead to prosecution of these parties without hesitation, as we've done before. We remain uh, committed to working minutes. with governments and stakeholders to develop and implement humane and effective methods for managing wild animals when necessary. We encourage continued investment in non-lethal methods to research and ensure that future management practices can be more humane. We welcome questions from the committee that reflect the complex realities of the issue and the necessity of aerial culling under the current circumstances. Thank you. Um, the committee has resolved for free flow questions. Um, so we will go to whichever committee member is seeking the call. The Honourable Wes Fang. Thank you. And I'm just going to circulate this first document if I could um, pass it up. And whilst I'm doing that, I've just got a few questions. Um, Mr Wilkie, in your opening statement, you spoke about groups that um, didn't believe that aerial culling was humane um, were targeting the RSPCA in a political manner. Who are you referring to? Who am I referring to specifically? Yes, Sorry. specifically. Who are you referring to? You said groups and people were targeting you. Who are you referring to? There are groups in politics, groups in the media, Who? groups in the communities. Who? I'm asking for specifics here. You've made an allegation. Who is targeting you? Politicians, media, Name members them. of the community. Who? Who is targeting you? I'll take that on notice. Thank you. Um, Mr Wilkie, I note that um, in your opening statement you um, spoke about uh, government funding um, and you also, uh, it was also spoken about in the previous PC4 inquiry into the, um, into the Pochter um, uh, charitable organisations enforcement um, inquiry. Um, why is there such a focus on RSPCA funding at the moment from the RSPCA? As I outlined, there's currently not um, an allocation of resources that will continue the operations we've had across the last 12 months. Okay. I want to have, if anything, more resources allocated than there was <coughs> the last 12 months. I want to have better outcomes than the last 12 months. I want continuous improvement for animal welfare in this state and for the enforcement of the laws that ensure that. Okay. So the more resources that you allocate, the more outcomes can be delivered. No, no. That's been proven by the last financial year yep. um, and uh, I, I hope will be considered by this committee and those in government. Thank you. I'm going to take you now to this, uh, which is a transcript of the uh, inquiry that I spoke about previously, the Pochter 
um, the charitable organisations um, uh, enforcing POCTA um, inquiry that's being held by PC4. These are answers that you gave in that hearing. Um, do you recall giving these answers? Yes. Okay. And you'll see over the page, um, uh, I asked again, and, and specifically what I was asking you was um, whether you had um, sent any disappearing WhatsApp messages to anybody on the committee for this inquiry or the Pochter inquiry, um, and you said uh, no, in effect. Um, you said you hadn't sent questions um, to uh, people on the committee. Um, that, is that a, a fair praxis of your evidence? Would you agree? Um, there is a transcript which gives my answers to each of the questions outlined. Okay. Well, people can make their own judgment. I'll now table this uh, document if I could. Um, you'll recall, Mr Wilkie, um, I think in this term of parliament, your first appearance before um, any of the Legislative Council inquiry committees was um, uh, the first... Uh, well, sorry, the RSPCA's um, first appearance was the Brumbies inquiry. Was that, is that correct in this term of parliament? I don't believe it. No. No? Okay. Um, well, certainly in my time, on the inqu inquiries that I've been on, um, it was the first time that the RSPCA had appeared before me in this term of parliament. And um, it was the first of the Brumby inquiries where we had... And has the witness been given this no, document? Yep. <clears throat> Thank you. It's hard to pad time when they haven't got the document in front of them. Thank um, you. Now, thanks. Do you mean? I'm sorry, Mr. Fang. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, sorry, Ms. Jurd. I'm sorry, Mr. Fang. Are, are you asking about the date of the 18th of December, 2023? Um, so I was coming to that. Uh, oh. To yes. Um, That's the first transcript we have for That's evidence correct. taken on this inquiry. Yes. Yep. So the first hearing for the, um, the inquiry into the um, proposed area of Culling and Brumbies was held on the 18th of December. Now, you'll see on the first page um, in the red box uh, at 12.42, my colleague um, sent me a screenshot. That screenshot is next to that message with the arrow, which indicates that a disappearing WhatsApp message was sent to uh, Ms McDonald um, asking her to pass to me questions that I might ask the committee. So point of order, Chair. There's been a point of order taken. Um, look, uh, firstly, I, I'm not sure that this is entirely relevant to the terms of reference of this inquiry, but above and beyond that, I, I do think members should consider whether or not it's conducive to the orderly and fair conduct of an inquiry to ask a witness about any personal contact or correspondence they may have had with a committee member. Well, to the point of order, Chair, mm -hmm. um, the reason that I'm raising this now is that you'll see um, in at 12:38 p.m., Mr. Wilkie indicates that he'd like me to ask about uh, cameras on the helicopters, which is clearly part of the scope of this inquiry, and that's why I'm raising it now because this this uh, matter, the the RSPCA, their senior government relations uh, person, indicated they would like me to ask them about it because they're supportive of it. Now, I'm going to be asking questions about that. But um, this also raises uh, a concern because quite clearly under the transcript that I just tabled previously, Mr Wilkie indicated that he had not been doing this, even though I had the point screenshot to indicate that he was. Thank you. There's been a point, another a point, point of order. Of clarification. Mm. I assume we're talking, is that 18th December 1 of Brumby's inquiry? Mm. Yes. Right. So it's a completely different committee. Mm. Do you want to reconsider your allegations given what you've just said? The no, no, I, you, you'll see that I said in the second part, I said <coughs> in either of the committees. I, in, the second, in the second page? Yeah. During the committee's hearings, I'll ask you one last time. Da, 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 da. Have you sent, this brings me to anybody on this committee during the committee's hearings? That would imply PC4, not 
the Brumbies. Uh, no, inquiry. I did actually say I did raise. Uh, sorry, underneath. Um, may, may I ask, request that if we're going to go down this road, um, rather than have a this is yeah, it, it seems like a very long time. A, having a, a short deliberative meeting yep. so we can at least yep, I have agree. this laid out so we can seek advice from the clerks and then I mean, otherwise we're going to go, be going backwards yeah. and forwards. I'm, it's like a game of Tetris here. Yeah. On the, are, on you, the, are you seeking to move into a deliberative I, I now? I move just that for we short... have a short deliberative yeah. meeting Thank you. allow yeah. us to consider this line of questioning. Thank you. Uh, based on the Honourable Peter Primrose request, I'm sorry I'm going to have to ask um, everyone to leave the room shortly. We will call, be calling you back soon. Back on there. Thank you. Thank you and apologies for that and thank you for your patience. Um, we, are, we are back on um, and I will um, throw again to the Honourable Wes Fang. Thank you. Uh, Mr Walkie, um, the message that's on the uh, right hand side of that paper, um, uh, did you send that? Yeah. Yep. Um, the message that you sent at 12.50, sorry, 12.38 p.m. Could you read that out, please? In case you talk to Wes in the break, I'm happy to be asked about cameras and operations and we're all for it. What did you mean by that? I think it's pretty clear. There was discussion about that during the hearing and I said, if you're talking to your colleague, you can mention that that was be something which we can talk about in our session as well. What do you mean by you're all for it? Uh, well, it's a matter of testimony that RSPCA would support having cameras on the operations that are being undertaken during Kosciuszko National Park. Okay. Um, when did you come to that determination? Because obviously that was during the first day of the hearing. Um, in fact, you hadn't even, uh, uh, sorry, witnesses from the RSPCA hadn't even appeared at that stage. So. When did you form the view that, that cameras on operations were something that would be supported by the RSPCA? I'd have to take it on notice. I don't think it's been a new concept or a new thing of support to have cameras when there's operations of um, managing animals in general. Okay. So was it before you gave um, or oh, sorry, was it before you reviewed the SAPs from National Parks and Wildlife Service? Well, I just said I'll take it on notice for the exact okay. timing of that being a, a position. And what evidence did you have to form the view that um, the RSPCA was supportive of um, cameras uh, on the operations? <clears throat> it was just something that I knew. It was, it was a position that was known to me. Okay. So obviously um, you spoke about in your opening statement that um, the RSPCA uses, I guess, or you've reviewed scientific evidence um, in order to shift a position um, that you um, previously were opposed to um, aerial culling and that um, you've brought charges against a former government for um, animal cruelty in relation to um, aerial culling of Brumbies um, to now not being opposed to it. Um, when that evidence was reviewed, was that also when um, the position on cameras was um, adopted by the RSPCA? I've taken that on notice already. You've asked it previously, and okay. I'll do the same. So, given that I guess there's been a shift in the position, and that you know you, you've reviewed SOPs and um, I guess provided a letter to RSPCA saying that you've reviewed the SOPs and. Um, You've also indicated to me here, before you've even appeared at the inquiry, that there was support for cameras on operations. Um, why wasn't <coughs> there an insistence that um, cameras on operations be um, stipulated before RSPCA, uh, I guess, endorsed or, you know, uh, didn't oppose the SOPs from National Parks and Wildlife Service? It wasn't for us to, we, we, we didn't endorse or not oppose or take a position. We were asked to provide advice that would improve the animal welfare outcomes for the operations. The SOPs were reviewed, advice was given, and then the operation has been uh, undertaken. Okay. Um, did that advice include the use of cameras on the operations? 
I'll take it on notice. Okay. If it didn't, why not? Uh, filming the operation wouldn't change the welfare for an animal. So it wouldn't actually affect the animal welfare um, operations. It's more about for the community sentiment. Uh, if the community can have peace knowing that these are being um, filmed and that way it can be accessed or made public or in some way uh, reviewed properly, they're going to have a lot more confidence in what's being undertaken in Kosciuszko National Park. It's the same reason why people want to have uh, you know, CCTV in abattoirs or in all sorts of other animal facilities. Um, it just gives a level of confidence that you know what's going on there because animals can't speak very well for themselves. So, so not having cameras, Mr Wilkie, does that. I would say to you that it does exactly the opposite. Sorry, so not by having, not having cameras, it gives well, the, I mean, the, the sort of community more confidence. From a government relations person, um, having cameras on the helicopters during Guy Fawkes made sure that the inhumane treatment of those horses was revealed not just to yourselves but to the public. Not having them in this case makes sure that no one sees them. And I think the question that Mr Fang is asking is what caused the change? Is it? And I think the answer you're giving is, oh well it's okay to hide it. No, Perhaps I've offended. miscommunicated, but to be very, very clear, we are <coughs> supportive of cameras in the operations. I'm saying the cameras being so in operations why you would be a the good government thing. For not adopting your recommendation, we've told National Parks and Wildlife that we would support them, that they should have them, and we've discussed different ways of trying to have them in the operation. Just because we didn't put a media release out saying that we've no, don't, don't, done that doesn't mean we did or didn't discuss it. Me, we discussed it with them. Don't be trite. I haven't seen anywhere in your submissions in the previous inquiry, the previous hearings, where you actually stalwartly talked about this, and I actually had to extract it from Mr Coleman that he actually did support a position where cameras were uh, should have been made available on the firearms, on the skids of the helicopters and anywhere else they were needed. Extract and it now you're offering an explanation of the reason why we order. didn't do it is because order. we were hiding things. Order. Can we please allow the witness time to answer the question and not badger the witness? Thank you. Well, every time he opens uh, his mouth, he sticks well, it further order. in. Well, order. Thank you. Sorry, Mr Wilkie, did you have a response? Or, or Ms Jurd? I just was going to comment that it appeared there was a miscommunication in respect of the stance that Mr Wilkie had presented. Um, the advice that was sought from um, RSPCA um, experts was in relation to animal welfare implications. Compliance monitoring is a part of that and certainly had we been asked, I, I think my position is that well, um, well, cameras would always be um, a strong mechanism. And, and I'm endorsing what Mr Coleman said, that um, in terms of compliance monitoring, cameras are a good idea. But the RSPCA yeah, doesn't have the capacity and didn't well, at the time. That's okay. You can continue your answer, Ms. Jones. Well, we'll <laughs> mean we're not. Okay. And at the time we provided the comments, did not have the capacity to insist that National Parks and Wildlife do or not do anything. We can only provide advice. And I think the marked up SOPs have been provided previously. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Abigail Boyd. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you for coming along um, this afternoon. Um, I just wanted to talk about, in some of your responses just then, Mr Wilkie, the, the idea of having a camera or not having a camera, as you say, you know, the once aerial culling has been um, decided to be carried out, you know, the, the end result um, will be a number of, of horses being slaughtered. However, the way in which that is done is still very relevant as to how humane um, the actual kill ends up being. And I think we've heard a lot of evidence about, you know, whether it's the range or the different types of guns used or whatever, how many shots have gone into the, into the animal before it's killed. Um, is there also a, a, that role then for cameras to play in ensuring that, you know, that training's up to date and that these things are being done in the best possible way? I feel like we've lost that nuance in this conversation about the way in which aerial culling is executed. Yeah. Well, and certainly to take whatever lessons might be learnt um, by the people responsible for carrying it out, of course, um, and reviewing footage is mm. something that RSPCA inspectors regularly do, management do, 
um, on a um, fairly regular basis. I myself rely on that footage in court, mm. I would say, every time I appear in court. And so the capture of um, the evidence at first instance is always very important. So in terms of an ongoing program then of aerial culling, um, Ideally, it would seem you would be, someone would be reviewing that footage yes. um, to then give indications for the next time the culling is to occur. Um, you should be using this gun or doing this type of flight path or whatever. It, I, I'm not a shooter, I don't understand. But presumably there are ways in which we can maximise the, um, the animal welfare outcomes by improving the program over time. Yes. Um, what is the role of RSPCA, I guess, in... in continuing to sort of gradually improve that program over time? I think we've been um, participating via the um, audits that have been conducted, but certainly if there were footage available, of course, it wouldn't require someone to go in a helicopter that could be um, monitored in real time. Um, I, I, I'm not entirely certain, when I suppose you can ask them next, um, what the yeah. National Park's position is, but um, particularly in circumstances where I think our position is the reduction in horse populations within the National Park is only justified up to the point that it achieves or looks to within a reasonable degree of scientific certainty to achieve the reduction in biodiversity loss that is attendant upon the um, wild horse population in the National Park. Mm. And if that's at 3,000 horses, excellent. The um, estimate that's been provided hopefully will work before 2027. But if it's some time prior to then, then we should know that in advance. Mm. And it's the, and I think um, the RSPCA has always promoted a longitudinal research, kind of the best mechanism for dealing with criticisms about your methodology is showing you're working. And if there are methodological problems with the October audits, showing people how they're calculated, um, additional transparency, not less, and I, I don't think there's anything controversial about that. Mm. If I can also, like, the RSPCA position identifies the very thing that you're talking about, that it's going to be a humane method when it's done by, you know, very skilled people mm. and done with very particular conditions and rules and parameters and things around it. Um, we've done the proactive visits on the, the basis of checking that the SOPs can be followed, that the people who are there are capable of doing so mm. and that it's being implemented in the way that you would imagine from the document because reading an SOP and doing it on a mountain on, you know, pretty um, different terrain and all sorts of different conditions are quite different things. So being able mm. to actually observe it in play is a very different thing. You assume that people who are able to do it on one day will continue to do it. They don't have any... Um, motive to not do it the best way possible or how they are able to do it or how they've been trained to do it on other days that we are not there, for example. So mm. that gives us a level of confidence that those who are there are capable of doing it and will continue doing it and have been trained appropriately to mm. do it. So not all, yeah, I guess that's the point. Not all aerial culling exercises will be equal. Um, there will be different levels of, of quality and um, of, of the execution that then has a direct impact on exactly sort of the welfare outcomes and how humane it is. Um, and I guess that's, yeah, I worry sometimes that that's been lost in this debate, that that improvement um, around making sure that the way it's, it's executed is the best it possibly can on an on a ongoing basis. Thank you. And taking, sorry, also in mm -hmm. response, I suppose, to your comment yeah. that um, the RSPCA is not the possessor or the arbiter of all of this expertise. We possess um, expertise in... Um, certain confined aspects and I'm always very careful when I appear to confine my evidence to that which I have I think decent expertise in relation to but um, I, um... Um, th there are others and there are other jurisdictions we can learn from so there are other Australian based jurisdictions that um, you know there's reference in the submissions to Western Australia um, Victoria the ACT People are doing it in Australia. National parks, I assume, can access the expertise from their counterparts in other states also. Thank you. Can I uh, just turn to your current submission? Yes. Um, and it talks extensively about justification for why the Brumbies need culling. And you've just talked about that a little bit, and I think Mr Wilkie did too. Um, it goes for page and page and page about how that's all should be done and protecting endangered species and all that sort of stuff and 
we all agree with that. Uh, but when it actually comes to addressing the issue of humaneness, you really only in there address one issue, and that is in part D, and it talks about pursuit time. As if this is a major consideration, it is a consideration, but it doesn't talk about the lack of cameras, it doesn't talk about the lack of adequate calibres, and it doesn't talk about the number of times Brumbies are being shot to be killed, does it? Why would this submission omit that? It, it refers to available um, documents that have been refuted, reviewed. It attends itself to the terms of reference. Sorry, it's, could you talk a little bit more into the mic? I can't quite sorry. hear you. Sorry. It's six pages. I, I don't think it purports to be the fulsome overview of every issue that might relate to um, wild horse management in Kosciuszko National Park. Well, then why put a submission in at all if it's not going to be adequate to what your evidence is going to deal with? I mean, that's... Uh, our evidence response, our evidence in person response to questions asked us by the members of this committee and our submissions, and I, I will say the RSPCA files submissions many times a year in respect of significant aspects of animal welfare all over the state, frankly, and we do the very best we can. We do not have a team of policy officers. We have essentially um, the people that you see regularly before you at this table. Um, who are responsible for the production of those documents and we do it to the best of our ability at the time we do it. If something is omitted or needs to be clarified, then we take the opportunities available to us when we get asked questions by this committee and other committees of this type. I might just jump in with a few... Oh, sorry, did you have something to add? I was going to say, the submission, it, it speaks to the eight points that were asked of being spoken to by the committee um, and it outlines points on those. It also has... Um, at least 11 citations to um, research and other documents, which obviously, if you wanted to have a more fulsome understanding of the point being made, you could go to the different citations and read that. And no, I, I, under I understand the point. I understand the work, point. So. Okay. Can I, I, I've just got to put something to you in relation to humaneness, uh, which, again, I'm saying is not being dealt with in your paper. But based on the following information, it appears that the accuracy and penetration of shots taken in most cases were, were acceptable. The equipment is certainly lacking in sufficient power. This raises the question, are the shooters acting in a sufficiently ethical manner or following instructions and ignoring animal welfare? And I'll give you an extract from the animal welfare assessment uh, for feral horse shooting. And I quote, the extensive use of repeat shooting likely made an important contribution to the observed animal welfare outcomes. Repeat shooting was performed on all animals with a mean of seven and a half shots fired at each, at each horse and was done so relatively accurately with 98% of the bullet wounds found in the thorax. And then it goes on to talk about uh, use of monolithic copper bullets. I'm not gonna go into that with you because you don't, you're not across that. But no. my question is, the animal welfare report states that no animals were wounded with an average of seven shots required. Surely shots numbering one to six must be considered wounding shots. Do you agree? No, because that didn't outline that the seventh shot was the one that was fatal, nor did it outline um, any other things you could observe. So if you've got a horse which is struggling on the ground and it's paddling or it's kicking and that sort of stuff, you go, well, it hasn't been killed yet. So this, yet, this is but contrary to what... that hasn't been observed what? anywhere. It's just saying that there was a horse that was um, killed humanely and also had seven bullets used. So the shots one to six are not wounding shots? That's what you're telling me? As I just said, it didn't say that only shot seven was the one that caused a fatal um, a, a fatality to the horse. It's saying that the horse was killed humanely um, and that seven shots were used. The two so you, things you don't, are separate. You, so you don't agree that one to six caused suffering and therefore it was a bad humaneness outcome? If it outlined that one to six had not caused any fatality, then you might better draw a conclusion like that. But it's not what it outlines from what you read. Well, what does it outline then? That a horse was killed. Well, what about 1 to 15? 1 to 14 and the 15th shot is the killing shot. Is that what you're saying? Well, if it outlined the 15th shot as being the killing shot, that would be something worth taking into consideration. But it doesn't say that. For all it outlines, the first shot was the <coughs> fatal shot and there were six more there as insurance or to be you know completely sure about it or something like that which that's not the way it works in the real world 
If the animal's dead with the first shot, why do you need to shoot it six more times? Well, you may keep shooting it because it's not dead. It complies with the SOPs to do repeated passes over the animal to ensure that the animal is dead. So why, what's I think the difference the between shooting it then seven times and 15 times? I don't think they're pausing uh, to gauge a reaction or see how it's gone after the very first bullet and then doing one more. I hope that they're not being cautious with the bullets. Um, that's not going to be the main expense of the operation, not really the point of it. When they're taking the shot, in very quick succession, putting multiple bullets will make sure that the horse is going to die as quickly as possible and therefore have the least cruelty impact as possible. Can I just jump in, Can I just jump in there? You've just said um, you think that that's the case. Isn't it the RSPCA's job to know what the case is? Because in effect, how can you review the SOPs and provide comment on it if you think that that's what the the National Parks and Wildlife Service is doing. You should know and you should know with, with, with complete certainty mm. what's happening to say that you, you think that that's what's happening in relation to the additional shots only indicates that, you know, the, the, the rigour in providing feedback on the SOPs is clearly not there. The I reject the assertion entirely. The SOPs were provided in advance of the commencement of the um, program, I suppose. And so they had to be on their on the face of the document, knowing what we know and comparing it against um, historical versions of the same or similar documents. And given the advancements in animal welfare science between the in the twenty years between the two aerial culling programs, that that's how SOPs get reviewed. They are reviewed in advance of the commencement of the program. But you've also <laughs> provided feedback and attended um, culls during the trial, and I believe. Um, that there's an open invitation for the RSPCA to um, join in um, at any time that they uh, choose. Um, That's your, right. You should have certainty now in relation to what's occurring here. And again, to and indicate we, that and you And we do. Think the part that I said I think about is I don't think that they're worried about how many bullets are used because they're not really worried about it for an expense. And they're not taking these shots for accuracy practice or for any purpose along those lines, they are implementing a big program and they're putting a lot of shots in quick succession to make sure that it is the least cruel possible for that particular animal. So how do you assess the cruelty if you don't have a video camera to see what's going on? We've had our chief inspector on the, in, the in the helicopters helicopter. on the ground on multiple occasions and there have been dozens of post-mortems conducted. Post-mortem doesn't tell you what's happening while the animal's being shot. Well, That's after the event. It tells you it's dead. If you've got a post -mortem, it tells you that it's dead. If you go to a post-mortem and there is no signs of struggling, paddling or any struggle around the animal and then you inspect that there is an entry wound and an exit wound at the top and bottom of the chest and you see that the bullet has gone directly through the heart, you can be pretty sure about what's happened and what's been cruel, inhumane or not in that particular circumstance, which has been what, observed what on about if dozens sorry, of dozens of Sorry, order. Moments. Thank you. Look, sorry, just in the in interest of time, because I know that um, the, our session's been somewhat shortened and I know that uh, the government members do have some questions, um, I'll throw to the Honourable Bob Nanver. Um, thank you, Chair. I just want to come mm. to this issue of multiple shots. Mm. That there, there just seems to be some confusion about the role of multiple shots and the SOP. Um, is it your understanding that under the SOP, the initial shots are designed to cause either immediate death, death. or loss of consciousness? Yes. And then the following shots are either insurance, insurance shots or shots um, designed to ensure that the horse doesn't regain consciousness. Is that an accurate reflection of the SOP, as you understand Absolutely. it? Absolutely. Yes. Or might not even be necessary at all for any purpose, but... Okay. Um, and, sorry. And it's our role to um, undertake cruelty investigations, provide expert advice as best we can. It's not our job to um, supervise the killing of every animal that's conducted by various government departments every day in New South Wales. We, we simply couldn't be there for the number of uh, deaths that are occasioned in that way. Um, when, when you were consulted um, um, by the government with respect to the, the development of the current SOP. Um, what informed um, the RSPCA's views uh, with respect to supporting, um, making recommendations to it or not supporting 
um, the SIP when it was presented was there research, international research, um, um, other evidence that, that was relied on to make that judgment? Yes, and if you see the comments that in the track changes, you can see the comments that are entered by the RSPCA um, chief veterinarian. She's referred to, for example, um, suggestions for changing and enhancing the phrasing of certain provisions. So there were um, shoulds instead of musts. There was um, ambiguity around um, the phrasing and has provided um, back backup, I suppose, or support for the opinion, for example, that um, the use of a certain term in animal welfare science is um, acceptable or not acceptable. That's based on, I don't want to date her, but 20 odd years of um, animal welfare experience and a um, significant background of um, peer-reviewed literature. And, and I think Mr Wilkie referred out our submission has eight, I think, um, documents referred to in its terms as well. And there have been more since then, I, I notice, in some of the submissions I read last night. Um, we didn't provide comments to support particular provisions. We um, provided advice that um, certain phrasing may be used or not used and referenced, um, for example, um, older standards that might have been weakened or um, improvements in animal welfare science that should be achieved. That's, um, you, it's um, available. You can see it in the comments that are in the document. Um, okay, so you didn't just rely on internal expertise, but you looked at peer reviewed literature, both nationally and internationally. In That's right. And there are references yeah. contained, yeah. they're in bracket, in, in round brackets contained within the comments that were provided at the time. And as there are for our federated policy as well. So you can go on online, you can see our policy there and it's got a number of um, citations and references um, made as well to international research. Um, there, there does seem to be just some concern around just even the role of the RSPCA in providing mm -hmm. advice or recommendations to the government with respect to the SOP. Do you see it as inconsistent with the RSPCA's ob objects to play an advisory role um, to help stakeholders, um, including governments? Our objects um, in relation are, to these matters. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to speak over you. Our objects are to promote animal welfare, to promote good animal welfare improvements in animal welfare in New South Wales. And we give advice in many contexts. For example, I, I have reviewed draft animal welfare bills. I've filed submissions in respect of those bills. I've given evidence about that here. It is entirely within my role um, to give advice to the department about our experiences of enforcing POCTA over 90 years. If we were to say, um, you know, essentially this is not our gig, there is a chance that there would be um, either insufficient legislative and regulatory attention paid to issues of animal welfare, um, or that there might be unintended consequences. And, and if we can foresee that coming, isn't it our obligation to provide that advice? I know the answer to that. Yeah, but, sorry. Um, Hypothetical, I say it is If, I, if I can add on that, it would have been really easy to let this whole thing pass and say, oh, we can't give advice because of whatever reason. Um, it would have saved a lot of headache, a lot of time and trouble. Um, we've had inspectors um, out in the field have all sorts of issues with, you know, being doxxed online and being threatened and uh, all sorts of things because of this particular issue. Um, as I mentioned in my opening statement, there have been people who don't like our view and have made us a target for different reasons in different ways, um, it would have been super easy to just let the whole thing pass, but that wouldn't have helped the horses. It wouldn't help the Brumbies. If just one comment sure, in the right. SOP can slightly improve the welfare outcome for that horse, uh, that's our job, that's our motive. Sorry, and I should have said sometimes it's a statutory, statutorily mandated role that we play in the Greyhound Racing Act. We're obligated to perform an advisory position on the Animal Welfare Committee, exhibited Animals Protection Act, um, uh, Animals in Research. So there are, there are very obvious examples where Parliament has seen fit to require our participation in that way. 
Final question. Stuart, one more question. Oh, yeah. oh sorry. Um, I, I might jump in, sorry, with a few questions. I know there's quite a few people um, with, with questions and we've only got a few minutes left. Um, I just wanted to talk about the review of the Brumby um, rehoming that was commissioned by um, the New South Wales government. Um, and that review essentially found that NPWS has no statutory authority to oversee the welfare of Brumbies once they are rehomed. Um, so anything that happens to these horses after they are rehomed um, is a matter for the RSPCA, the Animal Welfare League or the police, um, as what's stated in, in that report. Yep. Um, first of all, I just want to know, does the RSPCA have the power under POCTA to proactively inspect the properties of Brumby rehomers? The RSPCA has proactive powers in accordance with 24G, capital G, of POCTA. Um, I don't believe, I, can I, I'll give you an answer and then I might seek to take it on notice. Um, yeah. But I don't believe that um, the regs would have rehoming organisations um, caught up within an animal trade. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I think it's unlikely that absent a complaint, the RSPCA would have authority to enter land, examine animals, potentially seize those animals. Well, um, sorry, was it for rehoming organisations or for rehomed Brumbies? Because if they're in a private citizen's home or if they're in a rehoming yeah. organisation, I think it might be a bit of a different answer from Ms. Jo. Well, if they're private citizens, then there's no doubt that they're not an animal trade and then we would not have the power under 24G. Okay, and, and sorry, and just to clarify, Ms. Jer, if, if they're a rehoming organisation, you're going to take that on notice mm. because you're not quite, because there's, there's a whole list of there's regs, a whole which list. I'm assuming is very difficult to memorise. And I don't, and I've got so many tabs open, I can't do that right now. Um, <laughs> no, that's fine. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, would you even have the details, I'm assuming, of where these Brumbies are even being rehomed unless there was a complaint that would come through? N no, and I don't understand that there's a requirement, oh, sorry, I withdraw that. There is a requirement, I understand, for the authorised rehomer to tell national parks if they have transferred uh, a Brumby. Okay. But I am aware of Brumbies that have ended up places that I don't believe were the subject of an appropriate notification. Uh -huh. And I know that because I had to file an application in Port Macquarie Local Court to have them produced, which you can imagine the local magistrate wasn't <laughs> entirely keen on 25 Brumbies presenting to Port Macquarie Local Court. Happily, they, a disclosure was made to permit the stock welfare panel. These were in the context of an ongoing stock welfare panel process. Um, a disclosure was made, so right. I could withdraw that application. But there are, there are examples that I am aware yeah. of that resulted in um, poor animal welfare outcomes and horses that I don't believe have adequate oversight, even right now. And, and does the RSPCA have the funding and the resources to monitor the wellbeing of these horses once they've been rehomed? Not at present, no. no. <laughs> and I, mean, I know that's a pretty silly I mean, question. We're four weeks into the financial year, so um, we're already kind of pushing things. Um, and I know for a fact that the local land services district veterinarian and at least three inspectors I am aware of travelled significant distances to try to find those horses, um, particularly a uh, mare and foal um, that were in a, in a very bad way actually. And so mm -hmm. not for the want of trying, we are attempting to maintain coverage over animals that we don't even, we're not even told when they come off park. Um, but I, and I believe that there is a quite um, stringent process for what happens from park to the rehomer. And of course, there's been, a, I understand, an audit done. Um, but yeah, there, there have been some gaps there, with, I suspect. With an amount of uh, money produced in one financial year, there's been huge, tremendous uplift, more than double the number of animals rescued from cruelty and neglect. Um, I think we're very, very far from the point of diminishing returns for investment in POCTA enforcement and animal welfare assistance for the communities across the state. So I do think it's um, pretty clear that there should be more allocation of resources. With more resourcing, you'll get better outcomes up to a, a point, and we're very far from that point. Um, and secondly, we're often talking about things like registers of um, horses or other animals as well. Um, when you have got registers, it makes the enforcement much easier because you can at least locate the animals, know where they are, see 
patterns and ideas of what's going on. If there's lots of mm. horses passing through one particular property, mm. it's worth going around there and having a look and that might give us basis for doing so. Mm. So with, with all of that in mind, sorry, just my, my final question. With all of that in mind, um, is, it, is it fair then that the report has sort of put this to the RSPCA where we've got situations like what happened at Wagga this report has basically concluded that um, there's no statutory authority within national parks. Um, there's no desire to change that statutory authority so that they can oversee it themselves and therefore it falls on the RSPCA. I wonder if they need to. I've wondered this for a little while. So if you think about um, the RSPCA seized two macaws, a breeding pair of macaws in a quilty investigation. And I really struggled to know, and I'm the lawyer, right? I probably don't have to worry about these things, but I really struggled to know what to do with them because these are animals that will outlive us and they'd had a horrible life up to the point that we seized them. And obviously our inspectors wanted to seize them for a better life. And, and so I required the party who took them, a not-for-profit party who took them from us under a deed of transfer to promise me that they wouldn't, promise me, the RSPCA, <laughs> that they wouldn't on-sell them for profit and that if they were going to transfer them they would tell us about it. And I don't even have to enforce that deed because they send photos, they update regularly. I appreciate though that I was talking about two macaws and we're talking about mm -hmm. thousands of horses. Don't get me wrong, I, I'm not saying that it couldn't be done but you could I think contractually bind people who take horses from you to make them tell you and then if they're not telling you stop giving them horses. I think That's I think where you close the loop on the data collection. Can I just ask though is that the case for any other horse in New South Wales? If it's so if it comes out of any type of industry. Yeah like if I just breed my horse and I sell oh, yeah. it to somebody, should I be... Oh, no one tells anyone That's anything. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no reporting or tracking. That's why I say it's an issue across problem. All, yeah. all species and all Ms. animals Jude, should be um, if I was registered and tracked in some way. observed by the RSPCA shooting a horse 17 times with the 308 using 180 grain monolithic bullets, would the RSPCA prosecute me? I can't... I, I don't know um, what um, ballistics... Um, well, forget about the ballistics, that might the mean. fact that I shot it 15 times. If there is evidence capable of proving the elements of an offence beyond reasonable doubt, the RSPCA would prosecute you. Yes. Are you in a helicopter or Sorry? Are you, it? Are you in a helicopter? No, I'm, I'm just talking about being on the ground. Oh, no, um, but if you do it from a helicopter, it's okay. Oh, well, maybe I should Order, be order. Thank you. Sorry, there was one more question by Ms Boyd. Comment. Well, uh, and, no, and we'll finish with, with the respect, last question. I don't think I've had an answer to that question. Well, I think, I think Ms. Jo did answer your question. Mr. Wilkie, would you answer that question? I think uh, Ms. Jo the question. I think Ms. Jo did Ms. provide... the question. Order. Thank you, Mr. Wilkie. You've got an answer. Order. Ms. Jo answered the question. Order. Oh, Ms. Jo okay. provided an know. answer. Okay. I'm an old shooter. Um, I'm pretty deaf. Well, I, <coughs> I heard the answer. I am going to I can give it again. If there is proof beyond reasonable doubt, capable to substantiate that the elements of an offence contrary to Pocter, it is likely a conviction would be recorded and there are no discretionary no, reasons about a prosecution. not to prosecute you, then the RSPCA would initiate charges and that would comply with the New South Wales DPP guidelines and our own prosecutorial policy. So you don't know actually whether it's cruel or not? I need a brief of evidence to work out whether or okay, not. Okay, thank you. Sorry, very super quick. Um, have you still not got told what your funding um, allocation is from the government for this financial year? No. Right, four weeks in. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, and thank you to both of our witnesses for attending today. Um, I think there was a few questions taken on notice. Um, so the um, committee secretary will be in contact with you about those and any other further questions. Um, and thank you again. Thank you. Now, uh, going to a short break until 3 p.m.
Thank you and welcome back to the inquiry hearing to the, into the proposed aerial shooting of Brumbies at Kosciuszko National Park. Um, I now welcome our next witness, Minister Sharp. Welcome and thank you for making the time to give evidence today. Uh, Minister Sharp, I remind you, you do not need to be sworn in as you've already been sworn, you've already sworn an oath to your office as a Member of Parliament. Um, would you like to start with a short opening statement though? Um, I would, if the committee would let me. I'm keen to just sort of update you on the state of play in terms of, of where we're up to with all of this, and I've got numbers and everything. So I can advise the committee that since um, the plan um, has started, which was from November 2021, just so people know, until the 26th of July 2024, there have been 8,944 horses removed from the park. 5,963 of them have been as a result of aerial shooting. 1,067 have been as a result of ground shooting. 1,008 have been as a result of rehoming. Transport to Anakari has been 672. Shooting in yards was 109. Tranquilised followed by bolt gun in yards was 70. Euthanised is 39 and there's 16 other deaths. Currently there's no aerial control being undertaken because of the winter weather. People will be aware it's snowing in the Kosciuszko, which is good, um, but it means that there's, no, there's not any current um, work undertaken at this point. It's possible that some operations may occur again before October uh, in terms of the opening of the park. I'd also just like the committee to be reminded that the park is normally closed at this time, this time of year. Um, in relation to one of the, and I know that this committee's paid a lot of attention to the animal welfare concerns and whether there have been any incidents that have occurred. There's been some things that have been floated in the media that have been incorrect um, and have been corrected on, over that time. But the point that I'd make is that we have, um, to date, there have been no incidents of animal welfare concern or, importantly, um, any issues with the safety of the staff or the contractors. Um, uh, we will be doing um, an, the aerial the count again um, in late October, as which is the time that we do it every year. The design is being finalised, and it will involve the aerial transects by helicopter with trained observers. Um, the good news, and I know that this committee has paid a lot of attention to this, is that we're looking at how we can improve the count all the time. And for the first time, we will be using mark recapture distance sampling, which I know the Honourable Emma Hurst has been very interested in. Um, we'll be doing that, um, and that will be used to analyse some of the data and estimate the population. We're also looking at the use of thermal cameras as well. Um, the and um, we, you know, that will be important going forward, given that the numbers are smaller, and we need to, and it is more challenging in terms of accuracy. Um, the passive trapping and rehoming operations have recommenced this week, which is good news. Um, but I do want to just let the committee know that it's um, this is not going to be huge numbers and um, it's just this is sort of the time where we wouldn't normally do it. We, we don't believe that the horses will necessarily be available for rehoming for around eight to ten weeks. Um, look, the reason for that is weather is the first place. There's obviously snow everywhere. Um, no further horses will be removed from the retention areas before October and that's where most of the existing trap sites previously um, were located. Um, so it means that new trap sites will need to be established. I'm not sure, I know that you've visited, I don't know whether you, you met with any of the staff that do the trapping, but the trapping is, is quite a lengthy process. Um, they basically slowly but surely build the traps um, to attract the horses and they sort of build them out over a period of time. So I just wanted to flag the good news is that rehoming is beginning again, um, but in terms of where when horses will um, be available for rehoming, my advice is that it'll be around eight to ten weeks. Um, what else do I need to tell you? Um, I thought I, I've written I've written to the committee, but I thought I'd put on record. I know that there's been interest from committee members about you know what happens once we reach the three thousand number and how we're going to manage that. Um, look, essentially, um, there'll be ongoing um, there'll be ongoing operations over a period of time that will basically maintain the horses at that number. Um, we expect that we'll still have to use control measures, trapping um, as well, and um, and rehoming, of course, um, and also um, the, uh, going to a knackery where horses are trapped but not accepted by rehomers. We will still be doing um, ground and aerial shooting as required. 
Um, some of that's because uh, some of the parts of the park you can't do trapping anywhere else, but also we d it, it's just about keeping the numbers there. And of course, and I know the Honourable Anna Mahurst is interested in this, we want to get to uh, the reproductive controls, trialling that and trying to implement that long term um, once we can try and make that work. So I'm happy to take questions from there, but that's sort of the most recent update. Thank you. Um, can I just start by clarifying in regards to your opening statement, you talked about a number of horses that were euthanised or classified as other deaths. Yes. Do you know what that actually refers to? Look, I don't know. I'll take it on notice. I don't know. But it's things like um, horses get hit by cars in the park. Um, and, and I know that one of the recent um, media inquiries we had was this allegation that a horse had been shot in the leg and not dealt with. That wasn't the case. Uh, the advice that I have is the horse was um, hit by a car and had, had wandered off when officers found it, they euthanised it. But happy to get a breakdown of what the other deaths are. Sometimes they kind of break their legs in the in the waterways, that kind of thing. But if you want a full breakdown, I can as much as I can give it to you, I'll, I'll get it, but I don't have it today. Thank you. Um, I just want to ask um, a few questions mm -hmm. about the investigation report yep. um, in regard that you provided yesterday. Yep. Um, the redacted version um, of the report um, we received is titled a rapid, rapid initial assessment. Yes, this um, is the sentient one. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Um, and says it completes phase one. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, and it talks about the terms of reference. I don't believe we have a copy of the terms of reference. Is that something that can be provided to the committee? I don't see why not. Um, I'm not sure why it's not to attachment to. Um, if you don't have it. I don't see why that would be a problem and I will happy to provide it. Thank you. Um, and also the fact that it says phase one, I mean, that suggests that there's more work to be done. No, phase, so as I understand it, and um, you can clarify this um, with the, the National Parks team who I believe are appearing this afternoon, but as I was, phase one is about whether, uh, is an investigation about whether there should, um, there has been misconduct and given that no misconduct was found, phase two doesn't continue. Okay. and. And also the report concludes that, um, and I quote, there are no allegations of wrongdoing that should be put to redacted. Yes. Um, and I assume that's the subject of the investigation. Yes, correct. Um, are you, does this say that the allegations of wrongdoing were never actually put to the staff member involved? I'd have to take that on notice. I believe that they were interviewed, but I don't, I'm not going to guess. So um, could take that. My, yeah. my view about this, and just to be clear, and this is why we provide it, is that mm. there was a thorough investigation into the allegations that were put forward. Um, I take all of those allegations seriously, and I was the one who initiated um, and asked for this to occur. Um, I believe that all of the evidence has been tested and there's been absolutely no evidence found against this staff member. And, um, you know, it's appropriate that we do robust investigation um, and it um, has, you know, th this staff member has been cleared, which is important. Um, but, you know, any of that other information, if you just want those details so we can follow it up. But, yeah, but it's just, it's just, it's just, I suppose we're just trying to put this, this together mm. based on the small amounts mm. that we do have. Um, and the sentence that there are no allegations of wrongdoing that should be put to this person suggests that maybe they were never actually... Um, asked about those allegations. Um, I don't believe that's right. But look, look let's not guess. Mm -hmm. let, let me just sort of say that. I mean, mm -hmm. I, there, there was a you know investigation of phone records, investigation of emails. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, my mm -hmm. reading of the report. If I actually, I'm sorry, let me just go back. Can I just? I mean, I guess because at the moment I'm just trying to piece. Yeah. You know, bits together from from the bits that we've been provided. I mean, normally. Um, there's a redacted version for the public, um, which makes a lot of sense, um, you know, to, to, for privacy reasons, but usually there's um, a full copy of the report provided to the committee um, under confidence um, and made confidential. Um, is there a reason why the committee hasn't been provided a confidential copy? To well, help us I think, understand. I think, well, I think the point here is, first, this staff member has been cleared in relation to the allegations that are made against them. Secondly, there is some details um, in uh, the full report that go to some of the investigation, the way in which investigations occurred that we did not want to, want to share. Um, so, with members of the committee? Yes, we want to keep, we want to keep, um, yes, we want to keep confidential, correct. 
Um, Sorry, my, my question is why is why did you want to keep that? Uh, I'm just talking about the members of this committee. Why what is the concern that members of this specific committee would have that information confidentially? Um, I'm happy. To, I'm happy to, re to revisit it. We I said to, previously to the committee that I provide as much information as I thought was appropriate and that gave. Um, that gave you know should give you the confidence that this has been done properly, um, and that's what we've provided. Yeah, I'm just. I, I suppose my questions are, are based on confusion because it is very difficult to piece it together with the amount that is redacted. Um, I would. I, I appreciate that you wouldn't want to make the entire report public, and I appreciate what you're saying in regards to that the staff member has been cleared, and therefore Correct. it would be problematic to make it public. Um, but I would encourage you to provide a confidential copy to the to just the members of this committee um, so that we can better understand it. Could I just follow on with just a follow on question from that? Yep, Chair? just one and then, and then <coughs> I've got you. some more. No, no, yeah. Um, uh, Minister, just in relation to that, um, obviously the committee is um, uh, reviewing um, and uh, looking at the issues related to aerial culling. Um, with the House of Review, you'd be well aware you've been, a, you know, a member of that House for a long time. Is it? Do you think it's concerning that a member of the executive government has decided to redact information um, to provide to the committee um, and not provided it in whole, even under confidence, um, in order for the committee to be able to do its job and form an opinion? No. Oh. How would you have reacted in opposition? Um, had well, that's a hypothetical. <laughs> um, no, I would like to think that whenever we come to these meetings and we're all doing the job, the important job that we all have to do, that the information is provided as open as possible. I have been extraordinarily open over every single detail of what's gone on here. Um, I am very concerned about um, staff being dragged into um, issues where they have been cleared. Um, I have endeavoured to provide the committee with as much information as I think that covers those issues. If you have further questions, we can keep talking about that. Um, but the point here is we've been very open. It is not normal that we would provide um, this level of information. And I think you'd, you, if you want to go back to previous governments, we definitely didn't in relation to investigations of staff. Um, and that was even when staff had done the wrong thing as opposed to uh, this where this staff member has been in my view, you know, accused of something. We took that accusation seriously. We've had it properly investigated. We've provided information in relation to it. Um, you know, if you, uh, it, it's a matter about, you know, whether we agree or disagree about um, whether that's sufficient and that's a matter, is a matter for the committee and yourselves. Thank you. Um, so, Minister, sorry, can I just clarify, um, are you happy to reconsider providing a confidential copy just to the members of this committee? Um, I'm happy to reconsider it, but I'm not committing to doing that. Can Thank just, you. Can I ask one question on that? On this specific yeah, on topic? This, yeah. Um, Minister, is it, are we talking, so we're talking about the, um, the, um, the report? Yes. Um, the rapid initial the assessment. The rapid initial assessment. Yes. So is it um, the material that has been redacted is the name of the person? Is the, the name person. of the person. Correct. And essentially, other than one small sentence it looks like to my eyes that has been covered the rest Two is paragraphs. purely no that's right the but name of the person and in my concern. understanding around the, the other reaction yeah, is about um, location of where I'm location of where some of these things occur we, ne we need to understand there's been very serious um, threats to staff mm. in relation to this whole operation they've had to do so I am very protective mm. of making sure that that's that part of that part of that is not identified. As I said, I've provided as much information and I think it's significant information, but I'm happy to relook at it if people want to know more. It would be good to know specifically what people what, actually want yeah. to understand because again, I mean my general my general view is that you know we should, you know, disclose as much as we can. This is a really sensitive matter to deal with a staff member who's been cleared. Yeah. And yeah. I'm not um, you know, I just want to make sure that we do that. But to go, to go back to the, the Chair's question, I'm happy to reconsider it. Um, if people really want to tell me too, though, about what, you, what, what it is you feel that you're missing or what you think that you need, like I, I take the point about whether he was ever um, actually interviewed, we're happy to sort of deal with that. Mm. But the point that I would make is Sorry, I believe... can I just clarify, um, 
My understanding from what I looked at was that we only actually received the executive summary. Yes, correct. And so it's not just names that were redacted, but we actually haven't received a, a copy of details yeah, of what, the entire investigation. I hear what you're saying. I'll, yeah. I'll think about it. I just I just wanted to clarify because it sounded like from Ms Higginson's question that it was just the name that's redacted. Mm -hmm. um, it's not correct. Which, it, which we actually haven't received the full report. Sure. I'm happy for the name to make, remain redacted. Through there is complications around some of that, as I said, but happy to look at it. Okay, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you a few questions about the investigation report um, into the rehoming program yep. as well. Yep. Um, and the report effectively found that there's um, that National Parks has no statutory authority to ensure the well-being and welfare of Brumbies. Um, given this, is the New South Wales government looking to amend the relevant legislation um, or looking into other options to make sure that the situation we saw at Wagga won't happen again, or, or are we just sitting with the conclusion of the report, what, which is this could potentially happen again? Well, a couple of things first. So obviously there were recommendations coming out of the report and we've accepted all of those and we're moving through those in terms of improvement. Um, the issue about who, what happens once the horses leave, um, leave the National Park is not unlike what happens to animals once they leave a pet shop or a breeder. So it's a, you know, I think there's sort of a bigger question here that you're asking. Um, the answer for me is that no, we're not looking at, at, at um, requiring um, additional sort of investigative powers or preemptive powers in relation to that. But we are, um, and I expect National Parks and Wildlife Service to obviously do what they're required to, which is to check in with the rehomers around what's going on with the horses that they're there. But no, we're not looking at um, you know, investigative powers or anything. I think that I think the issue that you identify is one that sort of exists across the way in which um, animals are managed in the state. It certainly does. Um, but I guess I'm, I'm confused as to why there was an investigation and the rehoming was stopped if the conclusion is, <coughs> oh, well, here's the problem. Um, like we, we identified the problem, but then essentially the conclusion is to take no action to try to resolve that. Um, the RSPCA were here um, a moment ago talking about, um, you know, whole of life tracking systems for horses and mm. being able to do that within horse racing mm. and with Brumbies, um, and that that would actually solve a lot of these problems. Um, rather than having a report that identifies the problem and then continue on and allow the problem to happen again, um, is the government looking into any solutions? Well. I with respect, I, I disagree with your analysis of what we're doing. Um, we've accepted the recommendations around the operating procedures. There will be, uh, you know, on the way in, in terms of rehome is better checking, and on the way out, the way we will deal with that. The broader issue around tracking, I think, is a, more, is a bigger issue that's beyond this particular program. Mm -hmm. um, the reason for the investigation was because um, I was unhappy. We, you know, it came to our attention. There was, I mean, it's a fairly unusual situation. This one person seemed to have found a way to get themselves free horses, uh, which they then used to produce pet food and a range of other things. I don't think anyone thinks that's right. We've had a whole of government response in relation to that. Um, you know, you, the, how we manage that into the future is, is to, you know, you're not expecting that when you're doing rehoming that necessarily people are setting up an illegal knackery. So I don't, you know, believe that that's something that it sits with national parks in terms of fixing, but I do think it's part of um, so you know, how we want the rehoming, how, how the rehoming program works. Mm -hmm. And the reason that we paused the rehoming program because I wanted to be satisfied, and it was only paused for about three months, and it's also over that winter period. There's no intention to stop rehoming. Rehoming is an incredibly important part of the way in which we manage horses in and out of the park. And it's something that I want to see con to, to continue. Mm -hmm. And it will continue into the future because there are people who want to take horses, which is really good. Um, and we want to make sure that those horses are, you know, are going to good places. Um, this is obviously not the case in terms of this particular case, which is what flushed it out. It was paused to make sure that there was no no others who were in that situation. We've now cleared that away. We're now working through the issue of how we uh, manage rehomers on the way in, as well as rehomers on the way out, and the horses that are going there. And I'm satisfied with that response. And, and, and Minister, you said that you know you don't see this as the responsibility of national parks, but surely you see that there is a responsibility of government to look into options to make sure that this doesn't happen again. The, the report itself actually 
recognises that the recommendations, if implemented, won't stop another Wagga incident? Well, I think there's a bigger issue around sort of whole of life traffic tracking, which I think you've identified. Um, you know, I think that government will you know will talk about that. But I, from my point of view, I believe we've dealt with the issues in relation to horses in Kosciuszko National Park and our rehoming program. We're committed to the rehoming program, and we'll continue to be so. Um, we're always looking for improvements, and I think that this has been um, a wake up call in relation to how. Uh, we need to make sure that you know people are doing the right thing when they when they want to be rehomers. Thank you. Um, um, the report essentially says that any welfare issues concerning the rehomed horses is a matter for um, the authorities such as the RSPCA and the Animal Welfare League. Um, are you aware that these agencies don't even have um, any indication in regards to how much funding that they have? Um, going forward in this financial year. Uh, I think they've still waited. They, they just mentioned, I think, was it four weeks um, after the budget? They're still unaware of how much funding that they will receive? Well, you'd be aware that that doesn't sit with me. The funding of the RSPCA that. doesn't sit with me. My understanding is they're working through those issues uh, with the minister responsible and they'll continue to do so. But, you know, there's no doubt um, everyone's under pressure in terms of our current um, financial situation, but I'd expect those get worked through with the relevant minister. Um, in answer to questions on notice, um, you advise that between the 4th of April and the 3rd of July this year, um, 4,604 Brumbies were killed in Kosciuszko, um, and the vast majority of them, 3,878, were killed in retention areas. Um, I'm just confused as to why there's been such a focus on the retention areas um, themselves. Why are so many of those horses that have been killed within the retention areas? Well, the short answer is that that's actually where the highest number of horses are, um, I'm advised. And um, we're working through, we're obviously working through carefully in relation to the 3,000 number and that continues. Um, so, you know, whether it's in a retention area, whether it's in a prevention area, or whether it's in a no, you know, a no-go area. We started in the no-go areas and people and, you know, the staff have moved through. Um, I'm very confident that there is way more than 3,000 horses uh, that are still in the park and we'll continue to work through until we get that number. Um, I'm really pleased that we're updating and um, and trying to improve the count all the time. So, sorry, Minister, are you saying that the, you're focused in the retention areas because the prevention areas um, where the argument is that the horses are at most at risk, that the shooters simply aren't finding enough horses in no, those areas? No, no, that's no, that's not no, that's not what then I'm saying. Then why have they gone to the retention areas? If they're you're working, that's where we're the working are. through all of the park because that there are up to 20,000 horses and we need to get them down to 3,000. And um, we're working through that area. Um, obviously the retention areas is going to be where the 3,000 will be retained into the future. Um, but there's no, I mean, again, you can ask, um, you, you can ask national parks in terms of how they decide it. But my understanding is that there's a, it, it's, there's a range of different reasons. Um, it's not, I'm not quite sure really what you're trying to ask about whether it's there's a risk here that, or... It's just bizarre that the major, the huge majority of horses that were killed were killed in the retention areas. Um, and there's a very, very small number of animals that have been killed, or horses I should say, that have been killed in the prevention areas. Um, and yeah. it just... I, I don't understand it. If, if they well, are the, the concentrate, well, the first thing I'd say is that the concentration is 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 more there. We still are very confident that there are over, you know, up to twenty thousand horses there. We're only we're only dealing with the work up to around at, at the minimum level. We're being taking a very conservative approach, which is around the, expecting there's around twelve thousand horses. Um, we need to move through that, through that. I would just make the point that various people t have made allegations that there's less than three thousand horses in the park. Clearly, given we've removed almost nine thousand, that shows that that's incorrect. Um, the point that we, well, what we're trying to do is to get the horses down as quickly as possible so that in the future we actually have to cull fewer horses. This is why we're doing this um, as, and, and dealing with the kind of damage to the park as well. So um, you can go, I'm happy, I think you should, I think probably right again, rather than me guessing, um, I think asking National Parks the details of, you know, what, when, but there are issues around the conditions on the day. I mean, it's a very big park. Um, there's also, you know, in some of the um, 
the sort of more wilderness areas, there are fewer horses. I mean, part of the thing we're trying to do is to is to move them out of those very sensitive areas because they've started to move into that part. So because the numbers have been so high, that's not normally where the horses exist. The horses prefer to be on the plains and that's where the, that's where the vast majority of them are. But look, I'm not going to guess around the whole distribution other than to say, um, you know, we're carefully doing what we need to do, which is to reduce the, ho the horses down to 3,000, and we're doing that in all areas of the park when we can. The Honourable West Fang. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, Minister, I'm just going to ask if I could have these documents. Uh, have you numbered them? Sorry? Have you got numbers on them? Oh, look, well, I've numbered pages, the pages. They're, 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 I hope they're not numbered, numbered pages, the pages. However, they are. Uh, you haven't numbered the pages. Have I taught you nothing? They're in sequence, Minister, and I've stapled them. <laughs> by hand, myself. Oh, well, well, let's, for you. Let, let's see. Let's see so how we I'm go. So I'm going to ask if I could have these uh, circulated. Let's see how we go. Um, and look, the page numbers are on there. As I said, um, <coughs> they're only transcripts. So I mean, I, I'm, I'm fairly sure you know your way around a transcript of a legislative council inquiry. I do, but not this inquiry. Hey. I think the minister's. I think the minister's done pretty well. My stress is that this evidence is not based on evidence given to this inquiry. Oh no, this, um, this, is, uh, this is actually this inquiry. It's, um, uh, Minister, this is uh, the transcript of your Thank earlier you. appearance. Yeah. Um, okay. And it was the previous in, uh, hearing to this one, yeah. where I guess we discussed um, the Wagga issues, yep. I'll call it. Um, and you'll see that I've highlighted some comments and um, they're predominantly the answers you gave around yeah. Um, the, the ceasing I of rehoming. I stand by all of them. Yep. Yes, then no, no, I appreciate Thank that. You. <laughs> um, you know, you've said that um, part of, uh, I guess, the, the, the reason why we stopped rehoming was because of the Wagga knackery issue. Mm -hmm. I think it was shocking for people. Yep. Um, you said that um, obviously you were very concerned about the rehoming aspect of it, yep. um, that you were extremely concerned when you heard about it, and you took action straight away when you were alerted to I it. I did. You indicated that uh, because uh, you don't consider the rehoming of uh, 260 horses that are illegally uh, uh, are, um, are then disposed of um, disposed of a good rehoming program. Um, you've said that I do not think the outcome where 260 horses were rehomed and didn't survive to be a good one. Correct. So um, we can all be in agreement. I think that these were your answers, and and that and I stand there by was, them. There was. Um, I would say um, inadequate um, uh, outcomes for those horses um, sure. because you were obviously concerned. As, as to the other horses that had come from other places as well, it ended up at the Nat Nackery. And I, I don't disagree with you there, Minister. Um, I'll just table Peace in this. our time. Sorry? Peace in our time. Well, for the moment. Um, I'll table this second one which are extracts of the report that we've, um, and I've highlighted certain sections of it. Um, but it really does lead on from, I guess, what the chair was discussing with you around the, the inadequate, I'd say, uh, outcomes of this inquiry um, that effectively are, it, it, Failing to understand what created your concern, your um, uh, you, your reason for ceasing the rehoming program, um, it hasn't addressed any of those issues, really, has it? Well, I just uh, so are we talking? Are you asking me about the things that you've highlighted? Well, no, no, Which I'm going to come to the those. highlight is very helpful. I, no, no, I appreciate I, I, that. Well, I, I, I do try, Minister. You see, it's I'm, I'm, I'm an evolving person. I, you know. Mr. Fang is improving in his use of documents. Very good. All right. Uh, so no, tell me what. So, so. Well, no, I mean, no, I no. I, I, I guess I had I had questions in my head that I would ask while the documents were being circulated, so that you know we weren't sitting here looking at each other whilst the documents were being circulated. Okay. The first question that I had was is that, in effect, the report doesn't address any of the concerns that you told the committee about previously. Um, you, were, you were concerned about the, you know, the shocking nature of it, and you said people were rightly shocked. Mm -hmm. You said that you, you, know, you didn't think it was a good rehoming program no. when 260 are slaughtered like that. This report addresses none of those issues. Well, I disagree about that. The two, the two things I'd say about that is this was 
My concern about this is making sure that National Parks and Wildlife Service are doing the right thing in terms of rehoming. I don't, I stand by everything that I have said. The fact that horses went to a place and, and basically were just used in a legal and knackery as free horses for pet food um, is not a good outcome. Mm -hmm. um, that's why we looked at what is the process for rehoming in relation to uh, what, you know, the bit that National Parks and Wildlife Service deals with. Um, and we've got recommendations from that and we're, we're applying that, I would, not, I would not want to see the same outcome that we've seen there. The second thing that I would say to you is that there was also a whole of government um, process around what happened with that knackery. It brought in a whole lot of things. There's roles for local council, what does it mean for the, um, for the racing industry in terms of where horses ended up there, what was the role of the food authority because there was illegal pet food. Thing. So, and there's been charges laid against that individual in relation to ammunition. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a bigger question around how that could occur mm. um, that's, uh, that I sort of indicated to the honour to the chair, um, which is also about sort of whole of life tracking for horse, you know, for horses or indeed any other uh, animals. I think there's lessons to be learnt from that. But it, but given to, coming back to your question, no, I believe that the investigation was adequate. Um, in fact, I think it was thorough, and I, I welcome the fact that it was as quick as it was. Um, it's pointed to how we need to um, improve the rehoming program, and I believe it will be as a result of this investigation. So, obviously, in your last appearance, you spoke about um, that there were um, less than desirable outcomes. Yep. What are you implementing this time round that's going to stop this happening again? Well, as I said to the chair, there were recommend there's recommendations coming. I don't know whether all the recommend they're in here. Are they in these documents? Uh, there are some of them. Um, Here's the, here's the recommendations. Uh, so, reconfirm the program intent and adjust <coughs> the standard operating procedures to reflect um, the role of the National Parks and Wildlife Service. Yes, we're doing that. Mm -hmm. um, clarifying the role of national parks and their relationship with other government agencies. Yes, we're doing that. Improve the application process. And I think this is where some of this is, gets really important. When people want to be rehomers, asking them, what are you intending to do as a rehomer? What is your plan? That sort of work will, will be undertaken. Mm -hmm. Formalising the improve the end-to-end -end processes supporting the program, which is again the check out, the check in, and making sure that we know what's what's going on and asking questions. Um, I believe it's going to be better as a result of that, and that's why we've accepted the recommendations. If you were operating in a legal knackery, would you likely say? I'm going to take these horses for pet food and operate and uh, and use them oh, in my illegal knackery? I, I don't know. Do you think you might need something that's slightly more rigorous than um, a better application process? Well, I suppose what I'd say to you is that I mean, this committee's been meeting for a long time. You've been looking at those issues. When you do your report, I anticipate that you'll make some recommendations in that area where you, where you believe we need to make improvements and the government will look at that. How much did this report cost, Minister? I don't know. I'd have to take it on notice. Thank, Thank you. Possibly. Um, I mean, just to, sorry, just to be clear though, this investigation happened because of important information that came to light from Ray Hadley, um, where um, he raised these allegations and I was immediately concerned and immediately said we need to have an independent inquiry into the allegations of the individual member of staff who has been cleared and we need to work through the issues that this has raised for the rehoming program. So um, I'm happy to give you the figure, but mm. this was um, a very important uh, these two are very important investigations that, you know, have been done very quickly and have been very done very thoroughly. Now, I, I was going to come to this, but just something you've said then is that you said that um, the allegations came about because of Ray Hadley. And what this report shows, and it isn't in the, the pages I've given you, is that the, it, wasn't the first, uh, it, it wasn't the first complaint. In fact, National Parks and Wildlife <laughs> Service had complaints previously about the person of interest and the report also shows that it was actually the person of interest that removed themselves from the rehoming program, yes, not because National they Parks had and Wildlife Service. Well, I think what this whole issue... But there has, were three complaints, Minister. Y y yes. I'd like to know everything that's happening at all times. Uh, that's not actually possible. I can only be in control of the things that I know when I find them, mm -hmm. and I took immediate action. Mm. I think the point though, in terms of this whole knackery, illegal knackery case is that there was issues in terms of shared data across government which is being addressed through mm -hmm. our response and that's what we're trying to tighten up. 
It is actually, I mean, this is a very unfortunate case, but it actually brought to the front a lot of the questions that you're all asking that we all agree on are unacceptable and governments responding to those. Um, we don't want it to happen again and we're working to make sure, you know, to do as much as we can to ensure that it doesn't. Yep. So I'll take you back just to your transcript. The first answer on page 32, Which the front bit? page, yep. um, you said um, that it was because of the Wagga Wagga Nacker issue and yep. it was shocking for people. That's yes. why you've instigated yes. the report. Yep. So in that case, then, Minister, why in the scoping um, exclusions is the investigation focused only on the program and the supply of wild horses to the person of interest and did not consider the person of interest, the conduct and actions of the person of interest or the suitability to be a rehomer? Two parts to that. One is because there was a whole of government response in relation to how we dealt with the issues that arose from this case and the person of interest. Um, and sorry, the second part, say again. Well, I just don't understand, um, given that it was so, the- So what's the second part of your question? Well, there was only one part, really, is that... Well, there's um, two parts. Well, so I've answered the first bit. Do you want to answer me the second? Well, the question was, was um, in relation to your statement that saying that it was because of the Wagga Nackery issue um, that you've had the investigation, why did you exclude the person of interest and their conduct in the rehoming program from the investigation? Because that's not what the investigation was about. As I said, there was two things happening. There was the whole of government trying to get to the bottom. You need to realise that all of this was happening at the same time as quickly as possible because we wanted to get to the bottom of how this could occur. And so there's a whole of government process where all of the various agencies pulled together by premiers are trying to do, and they're working through a range of those issues. Mm. Um, the issue that I have uh, direct oversight over is, um, is, is the National Parks and Wildlife Service and the rehoming program. Um, in relation to the actions of the, of, the, of the person of interest and their suitability to be a rehomer, it goes to um, the outcomes of this review, which is we need to do more work on the way in, we need to share data better, and we need to check in. And that's exactly what we're doing. But, <coughs> Minister, like, you, you do understand the, the issue here that... Yes, I do understand. That, I, that, I understand what you're no, no. saying to me, yes. yes. So why would you exclude the very well sorry just issue. to be clear it's an independent investigation yes that i did not interfere with no no i appreciate well. that but so, okay so okay. Who, who who commissioned the the inquiry who set the terms the of secretary. reference so why did the secretary exclude the person of interest and their conduct in relation to the rehoming well, well, from this inquiry when it, their conduct is the very reason why you've had the inquiry no, the reason why we've had the inquiry is that 260 horses that were rehomed by ended the up person of interest. Yes, are you going to let yes. me finish? Yep. I'm not quite sure the point that you're making here. Again, I'd say two things. One is I believe that this was a thorough investigation that dealt with the rehoming. Two, it's it's it had it what this case uncovered were holes in the way in which this operated, and we've now moved to close those. Um, and thirdly. <laughs> Um, if you've got issues around the investigation around that particular person of interest, there were a range of different inst investigations going on through the whole of government process. The only charges that were laid if you, were, um, I understand, to be ammunition charges, and that that is what this uh, program showed up. I don't believe that there is any inadequacy in relation to the way in which this investigation was held. But again, this is exactly what this committee is doing. It's why you're here. If you want to make recommendations around the way in which these investigations can be made, you can. Um, if you're suggesting that there was any any way for me to interfere in re in relation to this, that's wrong. If you if you suggest that I don't that there was any attempt to try and water down what was going down or, or in here or try and cover over this, that is I utterly reject that. Um, the point here is that this was an investigation that we did very quickly. It's about making sure that our rehoming program works, is functional, and that people can have trust, both those that want to rehome and those that care about what's happening with those horses that are rehomed, and that we'll be able to deal with that, and I believe that we've, we're achieving that. So you've mentioned a number of times that there was a whole of government response being yep. handled by the Premier's Department. Yep. Um, have they generated a report? Uh, good question. I don't know. I'd have to take it on notice. Whether it was a sort of... What they did is they pulled everyone together and we all dealt, because as I said, there was the Food Safety Authority, there's game, there was um, racing, 
There was National Parks and Wildlife. There were issues in terms of, yeah, there was the RSPCA. There was also local council. So um, I can't answer whether there was a report or whatever. I can take it on notice and let you know. So given that, I guess, these exclude, and there are a number of exclusions that are outlined on this page, but yep. I'm, I'm really concerned about the fact that we've excluded the actions and the engagement of the person of interest. Um, Why who are you is concerned about, like, what, what is the, what is, what, what is your concern? Well, I don't understand why we've excluded that, given that that is the the issue that is of most concern to people. And you've indicated that it was very shocking for people. And I think, you know, particularly being from Wagga, um, I understand the concern of people around Wagga. Um, I, I think that understanding how it occurred um, is, is, is crucial to understanding how we fix it in the future. So to exclude all of these aspects of it and only looking at the, the rehoming process, um, well, that's seems the to bit me that I, that's, the bit, that's me. the bit that is in my purview in mm. relation to that. If, if I understand are, that, are but you, however, are you, what are you? It's not our job to invest, investigate the motivations of an individual who is clearly doing the wrong thing. There were the right investigations with the right agencies in terms of you know whether no, it was minister, a matter for no no let me finish yeah. whether it was a matter for police whether it was a matter for the food authority whether it was a matter for what local council actually regulates. It, this was a complicated case. Um, I, I don't. I, I just don't understand what you think this investigation should have done in relation to this person. The conduct and actions of the POI or yes, their, suitabil or their suitability times. to be a rehomer. Yep. Now, I would have thought that the, the first point of call when looking at the rehoming program was understanding how this person was deemed suitable for rehoming, was considered suitable after any number of complaints and it's de there's a timeline in the report that outlines that um, and that ultimately it wasn't National Parks and Wildlife Service that removed their um, their approval. No, he got busted elsewhere and then he pulled himself off. I do yes. understand what happened here. Yes. yes. So, so to exclude all of that and to, to not look at how this person was considered and maintained their suitability for rehoming, I think completely misses the whole point of doing a report. Well, I look forward to your recommendations coming out of the committee's deliberations in relation to this. And I would just simply say, make the point that um, the, the whole reason we ended up having this report is because of the actions of this individual, which clearly were not acceptable to anyone. Um, the, the recommendations that come out of this report that say that we need to do better in terms of the application process, I think that's where you really, I mean, that's really where, it's to, it's, in my view, you're asking me for an opinion, but I probably shouldn't give it, but I'm going to. Um, you know, the key thing is this person applied and there was no reason to suggest that anyone knew that this is what was going to happen to those horses. So what we've realised through this investigation and, when, and the recommendations that we have accepted and are implementing is that we need to check on the way through what, you know, who this who this person is. The actions of one individual who clearly was aberrant in terms of the way he was interacting with all of the different agencies um, is the case. So, you know, I just don't accept um, your basic argument that somehow there's something wrong with this report. There's not because actually the actions and the recommendations that come out of it mean that someone like that person is not in a position, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't be able to be doing the rehoming um, in the future, and that's the entire point. If you turn to the next page, Minister, you'll see that the next thing I've highlighted... Um, uh, so is this page five? Page five. Yep. Um, I've highlighted the collection of data on the fate of the horses is only used to support the improvement of the program. Yes. Now, it was quite What's clear... What's wrong with that? Well, it was quite clear from the timeline that the person of interest failed on multiple occasions to provide that data that um, guides um, the, the, the program. Yep. Um, that should have been a warning sign to, to National Parks and Wildlife Service. And that's why we're fixing it. Yep, totally agree. But when you say um, the, the data is only used to Im for the improvement of the program, how is that the case when multiple failures to provide that data didn't in, didn't didn't give any? Um, yep, and that's what uh, trigger. Sorry, to, uh, no. th that's what the review uncovered. That's what we've said is not good. That's what we're fixing. 
So I can't go back and... Um, but you agree that the report says that, the, that there's no requirement on National Parks and Wildlife Service to insist on this data being given no, back? No, there wasn't. And that's why there's now the check-in and the recommendations that are in the report. I'll now move to the next thing that I've highlighted, which Great. is National Parks and Wildlife Service did not <coughs> receive information or guidance from other government agencies regarding the person of interest that would have required National yep. Parks and Wildlife Service to remove the POI from the program. Yep. Um, What's your problem with that? Well, given that you've excluded, I guess, the um, uh, their interactions and, and the... Um, I think you're misreading that. Sorry, with respect, I think you're misreading this. What this says is that they did not receive the information. This is what everyone accepts. The whole point of what, again, this important investigation has uncovered is there is not data sharing, that there were red flags from other... that there were red flags from other um, agencies that were not passed on to national parks, and they should have been. Again, zero disagreement from me. Totally unacceptable. But Minister, this is why. But this is, the timeline, this is but this is why the timeline indicates that mm. there were. There were complaints and concerns raised with National Parks and Wildlife Service, and that they did nothing about it. Well, again, you're from able 2021. To yes, I think. It, well. I mean, you haven't provided me with that information in terms of that time well, frame, and I don't have all of it in front of me. I'm no, pretty no, good okay. with remembering what's in the report, but, you know, you like to give me documents. If you had these, the timeline, you could point that out. I could probably give you a bit more information. But the point that I would say is that this is exactly why we did the review. The review is pointed to the inadequacies, and we've fronted those. We accept that things needed to change, and we're, and we're doing that. Yep. The issue, if, if, and I look, without the stuff in front of me, I'm, you know, I would just simply say... Where did that information come in? How does it integrate it? I mean, you know, you previously were in government. Um, sometimes it depends on where that information c comes into, whether it comes to the right person that would flag it. If it comes into someone who's got nothing to do with it, how do they pass that on? The whole point, and, you know, I would, you know, encourage all of my agencies all of the time, and I do this in government all the time, share the data, share the information, make sure it's getting to the right person so that if there are red flags, they're picked up and they're not left. So I'm going to take you to the last page okay. that I've highlighted and it t talks about the scope limitations. Yep. Um, I've highlighted the whole section of 1.6, okay. but, but in effect, it, it basically says that um, uh, they've relied on, on interviews the bit that really concerns me is we, we have not sought to verify the accuracy or completeness of the information made available to us, nor have we conducted any uh, procedures in the nature of an audit of the information or assumptions that, uh, uh, therein um, in any way, other than has been specifically stated in this report. Minister, we've got a report here that has excluded the actions of the person of interest that hasn't for, sought for, to verify... For good reason that I've explained. Yes, yes. That hasn't sought to verify the information um, that, it, um, that it contains. It hasn't um, indicated that the, there's requirements for uh, improvements in relation to um, the animal... The, the, the tracking and, and um, affirmation of animal welfare outcomes uh, during rehoming. What tangible improvements do you think the, the report <coughs> is going to provide to the rehoming program to ensure the National Parks and Wildlife Service aren't handing out horses um, and brumbies to somebody to turn into pet food? Recommendation one. We're confirming that we're committed to rehoming people that want to rehome horses should be able to, and we'll have a system and standing operating procedures that will um, work to maintain the welfare and the care for those animals. Clarifying the role of National Parks and Wildlife and their relationship with other government agencies. Again, we've talked about this a lot. This is about improving data and dealing with all of those matters. Improving the application process. We need to make sure that we understand that the people, what people's intent is in relation to um, the rehoming of horses, and then checking in at the end. Um, that is a significant and absolutely important thing. The whole point of this was to get to the bottom of it. I'm not sure whether you're 
in favour or against of rehoming. I'm not quite sure what you want. I know that uh, the chair is very keen on rehoming because she knows that there are people that actually that actually saves those animals, um, that they can go to good and loving homes, they can be used in a whole range of ways, um, and that's fine, and that's what we want to continue. So, Minister, the, the role that I've got is to make sure that that's done in a way that puts animal welfare at the front, and that it, and that it works through. I believe this investigation was thorough. I believe this inve investigation has given us the direction that we need. But again, I would welcome the committee's uh, recommendations as a result of this um, this report and, and this inquiry, and obviously the government will give them due consideration once they're finalised. Minister, the last thing I want to say on this is that... Is it a question or is it a comment? Well, it's a question, <laughs> but is it's it a question, really but question? I'm, I'm framing it in a way. Sure? I'm framing the question in a way. <laughs> I and I am sure... I am sure, Minister. I'm framing it. I'm framing it in a way. If this well, was you a report, try to verbal it, so, so, but sure, you go there. That's fine. I might take it as a comment, but let's see how you go. If this was a report on how to improve um, the the loss of lives on the roads, and it says improve the roads, that's, yeah, that's an obvious. Kind of what the roads an obvious does. It's yes. an obvious answer. Yes. The question is, funnily like, enough, how? Nothing in this report indicates how you're going to do it. Well, I, th I just disagree with you on that. We can, we can take this up. If you, want, if you want me to provide to the committee some more specific work that's being undertaken in relation to those recommendations, uh, yes, Minister, I can that's assure exactly you that's a, what, well, that I'm is happy exactly to do what that. this committee wants. We Great. want the details, like, which is why the chair's upset that you've redacted half the report. Don't verbal it's the chair, why, actually. Is, I'm not verbaling the chair. Oh, she's she's that devastated that the report we, was, was... Just keep uh, doing it then. You know, thank you for um, telling us what we feel, Mr well, Fang. We're, well, we're all really happy chair, to hear it. Oh, sorry. Because you obviously Minister, know better. Order. order. It's thank really you. good when you uh, speak on behalf of us. We love it. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Well, uh, now you're verbaling Wes, me. Uh, order. The Honourable Wes Fang, do you have a question? Well... Yeah, where's the question? <laughs> the question was, is how are you going to improve it? It says to it says to improve it, and you keep pointing to these recommendations, saying improve, improve. And our acceptance improve. of the recommendations, and if you would like some dot points on how those are rolling out, happy to provide them to the committee, and in fact would welcome them. And as a as a uh, addendum are we to the hearing? question, are we having another hearing? I'm happy to come back. Mm. Yeah, I reckon we should. We've got estimates. I reckon you can we should. spend all your time with me at estimates about. But look, well, I, I won't. I, won't I, all sorry, my time, I don't want to be rude about it. Um, to just to the committee. Look, these are serious questions. Um, I don't think anyone has thought that what happened here was a good thing. No one has. I have sought to get the investigations done, to get the improvement processes underway and to make sure that rehoming is rigorous and robust and caring and a very important part of the future of managing horses in Kosciuszko National Park, and that's what we're doing. Thank you. Um, Donable Borzak, did you have any questions that you wanted no, to pose? Thank you. Um, I've just got a couple of last questions. Sure. Um, I think this is one that you might need to take on notice, sure. but if you can, um, are you able to provide the total cost um, of the aerial killing program to date? Um, so I can give you up to date. So I, uh, Mr. Borsak actually asked me this re yeah, recently, yeah. and I've, I gave it to him on notice, and I'm happy um, I actually brought that in because I thought I might get asked this today. Um, let me just check. I do actually have this. Oh, hang on. Okay. So this is up until the 1st of July. So um, uh, up until the... Oh, sorry, it's over across... OK, well, why don't I provide the following information? So from, from November 21 to June 22, there were 339 horses removed and it cost around 781... It's just round... 780,000, I'm just rounding. Between 20, tw the years 22, 23 financial year, there were 1,274 horses removed, and that was around $1.2 million. From the 1st of July, 2023, until 18th of June, which is the latest figures that we had, at that point, there were around 7,247 horses removed. The cost was around $6.3 million. So um, the information that I've got is that between November 21 and the 18th of June 24, the cost was $8.2 million, um, 8,860 horses removed. Thank you. Um, and do you have um, an, an anticipated date that shooting would recommence? So my advice, so obviously it's paused now. Um, we're doing the count in October. 
Um, it's possible, but that's late October, so it's quite possible that there will be... Um, that, that shooting will uh, recommence um, probably in October. Um, but that's, again, subject to all of the usual caveats, weather, um, availability, what else is happening at the time, um, those kind of things. But it is quite likely that um, we expect to recommence in October. Um, and that's after the count, sorry? No, might, no, there might be some before the count as well. But obviously while the count's being undertaken, there won't be anything happening then because yeah. we need to, we need to you know, do that properly. Um, and the, the next population count itself, you're still planning to use the, the same method, counting methodology? Well, this is sort of just at the beginning. So, so yes, so we're obviously trying... The, the point with the count, too, is to make sure that we're, compare, we're doing it the same way so that it's, it's you know, replicable. Um, but we are... But, the, but there's two things. There's one that we're definitely doing, which is that we'll be using the mark recapture distance sampling um, to, in this count. Um, which will be used to analyse the data and help with the population estimate. And we're also uh, considering the use of thermal cameras to support the analysis. Um, that would obviously be a big step forward if we know exactly, if we can actually get down to exactly how many there are. Um, there's some pretty good technology coming on board. So we're, we're looking at doing that. Um, my advice is um, this will help us get a population across the park, but it'll become more important in terms of the retention areas over the time because we've got fewer horses. Thank you. Um, and just in regards to um, going back to the report and, you know, the the part of the report that this is the rehoming report, sorry, um, about the fact that any welfare issues concerning the horses once rehomed is a matter for the authorities. Um, I also asked the RSPCA in this morning's yeah, session. Yeah, actually, saw, I, saw, if, I saw the tail end of that. So yeah. Yeah, they said that they don't think that they actually have the power um, to actually. Um, well, certainly, if it's an individual um, rehomer, they're unclear if they've got the power to actually investigate um, rehoming organisations unless there's a specific complaint. Um, so there's still obviously a big gap here. Is this something that you are going to be working with the Agriculture Minister on um, in any capacity to try to make sure that, that there is some sort of change here? I mean, I thought it was an interesting discussion. Um, I'm happy to sort of take on notice that sort of specific, but my understanding of the way that the legislation operates is this is not dissimilar to how it all operates. So RSPCA act on the, ba on the basis of complaints. Yes. They don't necessarily just do proactive walking in. There's a whole range of issues around whether they've got um, the powers to just sort of walk onto someone's private property and under, and, and under what circumstances. So my understanding is that that's, not, that's the same as sort of everywhere else. There's nothing particularly mm. different about that. But look, that's, I'm not a lawyer um, and this is not my legislation. So, mm. um, I, you know, I, I just would put the caveat on that that I'll come back to the committee to clarify what our understanding is in relation to that, um, just to make sure that I haven't said the wrong thing, but also mm. just that that's where, how I understand it. The broader issue I think that this is thrown up is, again, that sort of you know, when, when do we intervene in relation to animal welfare, under what circumstances, what powers do people have? I think that's part of the broader conversation around POCTA and the way in which the animal welfare organisations legislation is established. It's not... I mean, I am one... You know, the, the horses in rehoming is a very small part of actually the whole kind of way in which we manage uh, the care and protection of animals. Mm. So, um, But I'll come back if there's sort of based yeah. on those questions just to clarify anything. Yeah, I think I think I think what I'm trying to say really is that this is just another example of where the current animal protection legislation falls through. And you're right that it isn't just this one area. No. Um, but I think that here is a really good example of how the entire legislative structure is still failing. Um, I'll, I'll and defer and to your understanding of the legislation area. on animals than, than, than <laughs> anyone else. So, so, look, that's fine, but I do think it's, it's not, again, it's not special. Um, it is part of the <coughs> whole way and it's really part of the conversation that we're all having around what we're doing in terms of animal welfare legislation and obviously the government welcomes that conversation because we're all... Um, we're doing a lot of work in this area as well. Could I just ask quickly, um, how do you confirm the number of horses that are killed, um, particularly shot from the air um is it the the shooter counts or the pilot keeps count or i, I think imagine you're, i think you're getting i think you're getting to have that conversation with people who are much more uh have much more expertise than i suggest that you ask them that question but i am very confident that we know exactly what the count is on every horse 
Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Minister, um, and thank you um, for your time giving evidence today. Um, there was several questions on notice, um, so the Secretary will be in contact with you about those questions and if the committee has further questions for you as well. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Mr Fleming and Mr Smith, uh, thank you for making the time to give evidence uh, this afternoon. Um, I remind you, you don't need to be sworn as you've previously been sworn in an early hearing before this committee. Um, would you like to start by making a brief statement? Uh, I was going to provide some additional information just for um, um, the chair in particular, I think asked a question about uh, the number of horses removed from uh, retention areas compared to removal areas. And I was just going to really confirm what the Minister had said and elaborate a little to say that the, um, the reason why the number of horses removed from removal uh, from retention areas is, is higher is because those areas are larger, but more importantly, those areas contain the, the densest populations of horses, like there are far more horses in retention areas to begin with. So that, that explains why there's more horses that have come out of retention areas and removal areas to date. But um, based on our numbers and the uh, original population estimate, uh, and using that science, we can be 97.5% confident that the population in those retention areas currently is at least, with 97.5% confidence, at least 3,712. So we've, we've managed the process conservatively to ensure that we stay well above the 3,000 uh, population target for retention areas. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, the committee's resolved for free flowing questions, so I'll give the call to a member who seeks it. Mr Fang. Thank you. Uh, Mr Fleming, I asked this question to the Minister and she suggested that I could ask uh, the following witnesses, which would be you. <laughs> um, so you can thank the Minister for this one. Um, uh, how is it that you keep a track of the number of horses that are killed? Is it um, is it the observer that literally just scratches yeah, the down on the Yeah, the navigator, yes, yeah. keep, keeps a record of, them, of, of all the horses that are shot. Okay. And... Um, we, we actually have quite a... We're very conscious of the level of public interest in the program, obviously. So uh, we have, after every operation, someone talking to the um, pilot, to the navigator, to the to the shooter to confirm things like, not just the numbers, but to confirm that there have been no adverse welfare incidents or anything <coughs> else that we, we should be thinking about. Yeah. Um, given that we've got about 5,000 odd, you know, give or take, and, you know, obviously programs cease now because of the weather and the snow, um, there's around 5,000 um, horses that have been culled by aerial means, 5,000 over. Um, what's happened in relation to the, um, the carcass management? Um, so we've been, we've been implementing the carcass management plan and um, I think Mr Smith will have the exact numbers that have been moved. Uh, obviously, uh, initially we try and avoid uh, shooting the horses if they're obviously in or close to waterways. Yep. But if have, having shot horses, if uh, they are within the um, within the distances that we designated in the carcass management plan, then they're moved either via vehicle or by helicopter. So I can add to that and say that there's been 328 removed under the carcass management plan. I can't give you what proportion of horses that is, but um, the number's 328 up to date. Okay, so be around six, seven percent of if we're talking about five thousand somewhere in that region. Yeah, I think the total number of uh, horses aerial shot is five thousand nine hundred sixty-three. Okay, so close enough to six thousand, then so probably about five percent between. Okay, so um, there's been about five percent thereabouts moved. When you say that they're moved or removed, what happens? Do you Move the carcass out of the waterway, but leave it within um, within uh, the park. Yes. Yes. Okay. So it would be fair to say that um, there or thereabouts, there <coughs> um, come opening time, and the thaw has set in, and 
um, people are traipsing through the park, there's going to be <coughs> there or there about 6,000 dead horses sitting around Kosciuszko. They're lying around. Dead well, yeah, true. Don't true. There's yeah, not a lot of sitting happening. Um, there will be carcasses in the park, that is correct. Uh, I mean, I should add, we do extensive aerial shooting in Kosciuszko National Park every year mm -hmm. and shoot thousands of deer, for example. Mm. So there are always carcasses in the park. Yeah. Um, this year there'll be deer, pigs and, and horses. Yeah. Um, obviously, we've tried to manage the, um, the program to avoid you know, some of the busiest times of the year across mm. the park. Um, and we've also tried to um, implement that carcass management plan. It's not just about waterways, it is also about um, sort of set distances from some of the uh, visitor infrastructure. Yeah. Um, it'd be fair to say though that 6,000 odd horse carcasses plus the um, deer and the um, pigs and the um, whatever, uh, you know, other uh, feral animals that have been culled at, at the time, obviously creates quite a food source, doesn't it? Um, if you're, well, I'll, I'll make two comments. One, this is what happens across the state on private and public land. I think LLS are shooting, I think, you know, certainly it's 10 in excess of 50,000 pigs, mostly on private land over the last 12 months, it'll be, it'll be more than that. Mm. And it's the same though, those carcasses, um, the, the standard practice, private or public land, mm. is for those carcasses to decompose in situ. Yeah. So, um, so I, it, it's not unusual in that sense. No. Um, no I... if, if, if you are moving to a related point, which is, um, is there any risk of an increase in pig numbers, for example, no, because we're shooting pigs at the same time. Um, is there any risk in relation to wild dogs? No, because we're delivering back across the state the, the you know the largest wild dog control program that the Park Service has implemented as well. Okay, um, but they do. Um, you would agree. Add additional food sources that, that wouldn't have necessarily been there and that will attract um, additional um, feral animals is that uh, is that not the is that uh, my, not the my no I, what i'm saying to you is that we're investing in significant feral pig control as well and significant wild dog control so i do not expect an increase in other feral animal numbers mm -hmm. in fact um, I hope, and you know, we'll be tracking this over the next couple of years. But I'm hoping it results in a decrease in other feral animal numbers because um, uh, the team, as they're um, implementing feral, uh, implementing the horse program, are removing sandbar pigs, uh, yep. other ferals as well. Is it is it possible at all that um, it's not just the horses that are creating? Um, a risk for uh, endangered species like the broad tooth rat. It's actually um, other feral animals, such as those wild dogs, the pigs, the deer, that are trampling through those grassy lands as well. Uh, the whether whether you take the broad tooth rat or any other threatened species, yes, there are a range of threats operating at a landscape scale. A number of feral herbivore species, feral predators, um, other threats. And that's why we're addressing, aiming to address all of those in an integra integrated way. Up until now, the problem has been we have not been addressing it in an integrated way because one of the key feral animals in the park has not been controlled. Mm. So now we get to do it in an integrated way. Um, but I will say in relation to the broad-toothed rat, um, the scientific committee, when they looked at that, and this is an independent scientific committee, they acknowledge that there are several threats and they say feral herbivores are a key threat and the feral herbivore that has the biggest impact, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but that's what they've said, right. is the horse. Mm. So, um, so I'm not sure exactly what you're getting at with your question, but I acknowledge there are a range of threats to native species. Um, 
uh, wild horses, feral horses are one of the key threats. They have a disproportionate impact on some species and unless the wild horse population is reduced we're going to see severe impacts on species like the broad-toothed rat and on the integrity of the park overall. Do you conduct um, culling operations at night? Uh, we obviously don't conduct aerial shooting at night. No. Um, so where you've got, I guess, a um, increased food source, you've got obviously other um, uh, feral animal issues in, in the park, um, and many of those feral animals feed at night. Um, would you not admit that it's creating potentially a more um, uh, or a riskier um, circumstance for some of those endangered species by leaving all those food sources around the park? No. For, for a start, I'm not accepting your assumption that there's an increased food source there because there's a whole lot of factors you need to take into account to determine okay. relatively what what that position is. But, but secondly, um, as I've said to you, we're removing more pigs because we're doing more aerial shooting mm. and we're implementing the biggest wild dog control program in the state. So I'm not expecting the risk that you're talking about, either an increase in pigs or dogs, I do not expect to eventuate. So mm. that threat I do not expect to increase. Secondly, removing horses means that we will see um, restoration of the vegetation, which means there'll be more cover and more food. Mm. So no, um, I'll be really clear about this reducing the horse population is significantly decreasing the threat to our native species. When we went to the park and we met with some of the um, Brumby advocates and spoke about rehoming, um, they indicated that there was a much larger appetite for rehoming horses than was, the, uh, I guess, available from the numbers that were provided. And, and it would seem that, you know, there was... Um, potentially some that were being uh, mistreated, um, potentially, um, and that's obviously been the discussion uh, earlier in the day. But I know that the chair and I had a quite a detailed discussion with some of them saying, well, okay, what if we had the circumstance where um, you were allowed to come in and take as many horses as you think you can rehome? Um, would, that, um, would that be possible? And it was a universal yes that that they could take a lot more than were currently being provided to them in the rehoming program <coughs> so given that when they're being rehomed even if they are um sent to an illegal knackery you're not leaving a, a i guess carcass in the park creating a greater food source which potentially creates more ecological problems for you um, wouldn't it be better to spend some of that $8.2 million in funding rehomers, providing them with adequate number of horses, um, and then not having to shoot horses and leaving those carcasses in the park? So, I mean, I just repeat for the record, I don't mean to argue with you, but I just repeat for the record that the horse carcasses we do not believe represent a threat to other native species. But in relation to the rehoming, if, if people, if there are rehomers who uh, are able to accept more horses, um, then I think that's great. So we welcome that. I mean, one of the challenges <coughs> for us is, if I look back at the number removed under the plan, I think, I'll correct this later if I get it wrong, but I think it's um, of the 8,944 horses that have um, been removed since the plan commenced, it's 1,008 rehoming and 672 to the knackery. Mm. And I do think, I mean, one of the challenges is that um, not all of the horses that we trap can find a home with rehomers, mm. e either because they're the wrong colour or the wrong sex or the wrong age or, or something like that. So. Um, you know, to the extent that um, rehomers would like to accept more, there's obviously capacity there um, to provide more horses. It wasn't always the case, though, that they used to trap the horses, was it? They used to go in there, like, you used to have the, the, the horse, you know, uh, Brumby advocates on horseback, 
they would go in, they would, for want of a better term, corral and herd the horses out, you know, out of the park into areas, and then they would, um, I guess, uh, from there, um, rehome them. Why, why, is, why is that not, given that it used to work so successfully, you know, a couple of decades ago, why, why has, has a program like that stopped? given that there is such an appetite for them, given that they've said that they're willing to do it and it's actually a better welfare outcome all around. Why um, aren't we doing that, given that, I mean, at worst, mm -hmm. they're going to end up in illegal knackery and shot and apparently that's Did not so much of a problem. I, I, I won't aim to comment in a lot of detail, Mr Fang, other than, other than to say the advice I've seen is that that does not deliver a better welfare outcome. But, how how um, is that the case? Uh, because of the stress involved in that operation. But, but let me try and come back to you on notice around your, your question generally. Um, the, other, the other part of the answer or the response, I think, is just to note that that's not one of the approved methods in the plan. So obviously from um, National Parks and Wildlife Service perspective, our, our job is to implement the plan. Well, could I facetiously suggest to you that what we could do is we could, um, the minister could call for expressions of interest to change the plan and then we could get some form letters and we could send in 8,000 odd form letters um, and then we could change the plan and um, then we could actually do that. Because I know that some of those, those um, people would welcome that and you know, given that we can do that to reinstate aerial culling, I'm sure we could do it to do this. Um, I won't comment on that, but um, I'm happy to take on notice the, the initial question um, and come back to you on, on why I think Anyway, the, the, the process that you described, why it's no longer a method or considered a, an appropriate method of I'd control. I'd appreciate that. No, I know that the, um, the Brumby advocates would appreciate that as well because I think they're, they're yeah. very keen to do that. And ha um, if, happy we can, to do if that we can provide some assistance to do that, I think that that'd be a good outcome for everybody. Well, happy to provide a response as to why it's not regarded as an appropriate form of control. And, um, and as I said, if, if there is um, more capacity for horses to be rehomed, re then I think that's great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I might jump in with a few uh, questions myself. Um, I asked the Minister this earlier. Um, in answers to questions on notice, I would just advise that between the 4th of April and the 3rd of July this year, 4,604 Brumbies were killed in Kosciuszko National Park. Um, and the vast majority of them, 3,878, were actually killed in the retention areas. Um, I'm just trying to work out why there's been so much focus on killing in the actual retention areas rather than the sensitive areas. Um, the main reason is that the largest horse populations are in the retention areas. So there are many, many more horses in the retention areas than in the removal areas, or they, they there were at the beginning of the program. Uh, so that meant that in order to meet the target of 3,000 in retention areas, more horses had to be removed from those areas. Uh, but ba based on our, we, we have been taking a conservative approach, so I, I understand the concern and, and the question. What, what we've aimed to do is um, doing the, 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 using the analysis that underpins the, the previous population estimate in, in um, 2023, uh, we calculate effectively, we, we work off the bottom of that 95% um, confidence interval. So for each of those retention areas, um, we work off the bottom of that interval and we leave a bit of a buffer. The, the short version of this is that um, we can be 97.5% confident that there's about three, at least 3,712 horses in the retention areas now. So we're aiming to be conservative this year and ensure that there are well over 3,000 left in retention areas. And then, as the Minister also said, um, move to a population survey at the end of this year, which um, is focused on not just the population across the park as a whole, but also specific population estimates for each retention area and utilising the distance sampling method that we've used in the past plus the mark recapture distance sampling method. Um, so just to clarify, the sensitive areas of the park have very low numbers of Brumbies in them. Is that, is that what you're saying? No, I'm saying that the retention areas have the highest population 
but so, but, sorry, but why wouldn't the priority be to protect the sensitive areas of the park? Wouldn't that be the I, I'm just very. If there are if there are brumbies in the sensitive areas, there, there why are, are you focusing on the retention areas? Well, I understand I was, there might be more animals there. What, what I was trying. Well, I guess what I was trying to say is, our statutory or legal obligation is to reduce the population in retention areas to three thousand. And so, if there are many more horse, I can't remember the exact population estimate, but it was around eleven thousand, I think, in those retention areas, which meant, in theory, we needed to take about eight thousand off to get to three thousand. Those retention areas are a mix of the most sensitive areas and some other areas that you might not put in that category. So, the retention areas, it, your question really goes to the heart, to the to the original plan and how how the lines on the map were drawn. Mm. And um, I'd have to probably take that on notice to give you a detailed response. Mm -hmm. But it took into account a range of factors. One was um, the, the, where the horses were and where the, in a sense, how we captured a cross-section of, of the horse population and its association with some of the heritage values in the park, mm. as well as the sensitive areas. So it was, a, it was trying to we were required by law to try and get a balance between um, draw the lines on the map not just around the most sensitive areas but around taking into account what are the most sensitive areas but also taking into account where the horses are and where horse population mm. should be retained so that's been one of the great challenges because there's there's some conflict there there are big populations of horses in some of the more sensitive areas um, and some of those areas of, are in retention zones, so we will be retaining horses in areas that um, uh, include some sensitive sites. But I suppose, you know, like what, one of the reasons, um, I guess, and, and this is part of where this whole inquiry sort of comes from, is, you know, is there adequate justification for a program? I think we all agree, and we've always agreed that aerial yeah. shooting is... is not something that anybody wants to do. Yeah. We're all on the same table on that. Yeah. Um, and then the position of, of some is that, that it's justified in these circumstances because the horses are causing X amount of damage um, in certain areas of the park, in sensitive areas and in, in prevention areas where we don't want the horses. And so I'm wondering then, if there are so, if we're focusing on the areas which are not prevention areas, where we where we're focusing instead on the retention areas. So we have we have three core obligations um, allied to those three areas. So mm. prevent, and, and sorry, prevent, so that, prevention areas are where there are currently no, or, or when the plan was drafted, there were no horses. Mm -hmm. So our obligation there is. If any horses turn up in the prevention area, we're to remove them. And mm -hmm. so those horses might come from immigration for, from outside the park, for example. Mm -hmm. um, then there are the removal areas. They are areas where we are to re remove all of the horses, reduce those the population there. And to sorry zero. to interrupt. The yeah. removal areas are they some of the most like? Wh what indicates an area as a removal area? Are they the most sensitive areas of the park? Or all, all of. Uh, all of it was a compromise in a sense where the lines were, the, the, it wasn't a case of draw a line around the most sensitive areas and remove horses from those areas. That could have been an approach, but it wasn't the approach because the, the formula in the act, and ex, uh, please, uh, I'm paraphrasing, so I apologize if I, if I don't get it quite right, but the formula in the act event essentially said, try and find a balance. So, um, there might be an area where there are horses and there's some historic associations with huts or other, uh, or a particular colour of horse, for example, that had some recognised value within the community. It might coincide with a sensitive area. Um, so a decision there, y you couldn't achieve both. So there were some areas that are sensitive areas that are still within retention areas because there's a compromise with the retention of horse values. So where that leaves us is, Removal areas and retention areas both include sensitive environmental areas. And the balance was some of those very sensitive areas will be now horse free. 
Some of them are still going to have horses, but the, the population of horses in those areas will be lower. So in a sense, both should benefit. Some sensitive areas are now going to be free of horses. Some sensitive areas will have a lower population of horses. Mm. But uh, I mean, the other point I want to make is the, the impact, we're talking about sensitive areas, but even, I mean, it's difficult. This is, an, it, this is a national park, so really every part of the park has significant ecological value. Uh, I'm happy to talk about sensitive areas in, in, for the purpose of this discussion as being some of the areas that are the most sensitive, but it is, you know, it's, an, it's, a, it's a national park that is globally significant because of the ecosystems, particularly the alpine ecosystems that are so rare in this part of the world. Mm. But what I'm trying to, I guess, that I, I still don't quite understand is you've got these removal areas yep. and yet the focus is still on the retention areas. Um, I would say that we've focused on both equally, but one had a starting population, and again, I'm, I'm going to try and just find where I think the starting population was. So the best estimate for the retention areas was in the order of 14 and a bit over 14,000, whereas the best estimate for the um, uh, removal areas was a bit less than 3,000. So, so you're starting using your best estimate, you start whatever that ratio is, it's about 25%, so you're roughly a quarter or a bit less than a quarter of the horses were in removal areas. So if we we're applying both equally, you would expect us to be removing three times as many horses from retention as we are from removal. Mm -hmm. And has the focus been on the obligations under the Act being prioritised, so those numbers being prioritised over focusing on the most sensitive areas in the park? Um, Maybe not over, but I, is that is that the focus I rather don't, than I don't think I don't think that's a choice that we're making. So, in a sense, the the decision around where to draw the lines on the map happened when the plan was made. Our obligation now is to implement the plan. So, um, we need to reduce the population in retention areas to three thousand. We, within that, we can focus on some of the operations on the more sensitive areas. That that is true, but we we have to work within that framework. Uh, I just want—I've got a couple of quick questions about the rehoming um, report as well. Um, it did show quite significant failures <coughs> in the way the rehoming program had been managed, um, including a lack of formal documentation, gaps in operational procedures a lack of follow-up on the fate returns um, and other concerns. Um, were you concerned about the findings in this report? Uh, I, like everyone, I was concerned about the um, discovery at Wagga and um, uh, I'm, I'm concerned if we're ever implementing a program to sort of less than the standard that we should be doing it. So. Um, I, I, I welcome it in the sense that it's, it's always good to have someone methodically look at how the program's operating and make some suggestions as to how it can be done better. Um, so we welcome that. We've accepted the recommendations and we're working through how to best give them effect. Can you, can you um, inform the committee on what steps have been taken um, so far to um, address, address the issues? Yep, I might ask Mr Smith, he's sort of... Uh, I, I'm expecting um, uh, a proposal, basically a proposal to give effect to the implement, implement the recommendation. So um, Mr Smith can speak a little bit to the sorts of things that we're looking at, but bear in mind, please, we're still in the process of finalising the best response because we want to get it right. So uh, there was, as, as you know, there was four recommendations uh, and we're looking at what we need to do actually to implement to implement those, and there's a range of things, um, which I know the minister covered a little bit in um, her session just before. But um, some of the specifics, it, it, it did highlight that we do need to more clearly identify and reconfirm the program intent. So we're documenting that in a quite a clear way that outlines what our responsibilities are, what a rehomer's responsibilities are, uh, and that obviously needs to take into account the statutory authority and who who has got that authority. Mm. Um, 
there's a range of improvements that the report does identify around the application process. Um, you're right in terms of it, the, the sort of documentation and the way that um, that's recorded so that it's clear because that that isn't that hasn't been documented in the way um, that the, there are certainly the reports identified that needs to be. Uh, there is some work clearly around, um, and I know there was a bit of discussion before about, uh, and it calls out forming an MOU or something with, with particularly the RSPCA and Racing New South Wales to ensure there's better exchange of information. So we're in the process of putting all of that together. Um, mm. That includes also updating the guidelines. It does apply to the rehoming element as well. And there's some things in there which we're particularly looking at to improve. Um, one of those is the fate returns or the, or the program returns. Um, there's a number of other elements um, in terms of the frequency of the application process, um, the need to ensure that um, uh, we, we're looking at people needing to be able to supply some sort of reference so that we've got a better ability to actually check a rehomer uh, when they come onto the system. Um, and of course, um, uh, one of the things that's identified in the report, particularly around the person of interest, was the the fact that they were on the Racing New South Wales excluded list. So we're including that as a you know as a something that would make somebody obviously ineligible. So there's a, there's a range of improvements, which will flow right through the system, um, from the time somebody puts an application into better documentation and better sort of governance of the program. Mm. Um, I right. guess one thing that's come up a lot, and, and and you sort of mentioned it in regards to um, making it clear that. Um, Parks doesn't actually have any statutory authority, um, but does um, is are you concerned that we're going to see this happen again? Given the report recognises that it's very possible it could happen again, um, and the government's indicated that they they have no plans to actually change that statutory authority to stop it from happening. I, we, I mean, I think it's important to recognise. I think there's roughly. 3,000 horses in total that have been rehomed over the years um, and by and large you know as you know the rehomers do a great job generally speaking so um, I guess what we're trying to do is um, put together a package that minimizes the risk mm. we possibly can't eliminate it but what what Sorry, can we, I'm just what, I, I just want to talk about I guess, you know, like the recommendations kind of tinker around the edges in regards to leading up to rehoming. Um, and, and I recognise those things could potentially help. Yeah. But the most significant thing that was brought up in this report was that National Parks doesn't have the statutory authority yeah. to ensure the welfare of those horses once they're rehomed. And we heard from the RSPCA today that they also don't have the powers to do that. So there's this massive gaping hole and when I asked the minister if she's looking at giving statutory authority to do parks to fix that big gaping hole, um, then and she said she said she wasn't, mm. and so we're left with this big gaping hole. And I, so I'm trying to sort of understand rather than tinkering around the edges before the animal is rehomed, which is still important to do, yeah. um, this massive problem that we've got that there is nobody with any authority or oversight in that after section is still this big problem? Uh, it, it, you, it's true, I don't think, that it's a national parks and wildlife responsibility. Once we're talking about domestic animals on private land, um, as you say, there's the RSPCA, there's LLS, there's DPI, there's local council, so, there's so police. What so I'm there's saying with those authorities is they don't, they don't have the power. Well, uh, and you don't have the power, and yeah. they don't have the power. So if, we've got this big hole. If everyone has <laughs> everyone has sort of bits of the puzzle, I guess is the way bits I was going to Bits of the puzzle, except for this big hole. Yeah. Once so an animal's rehomed, RSPCA doesn't have the power to oversight. National Parks doesn't have the statutory yeah. authority to oversight. So we're left with this hole. So we'll 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 obviously work very constructively and support anything that's across government in trying to make sure those bits of the puzzle fit together better and work more effectively. Um, um, but I guess what I'm trying to say is that hole still exists. The, the bits of the puzzle are, are those sort of prior sections where there could be, a, a, you know, memorandum of, of understanding, for example, more communication. Um, but this isn't bits of the puzzle sort of 
falling through. Yeah. This is nobody has the power to oversight this. And, 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 and there isn't any system set up for tracking, for example. RSPCA talked about whole of life tracking um, for both racehorses, for Brumbies. I know that this isn't just a, a, an issue within the rehoming of Brumbies. This is much broader than this. Um, but it has created this example of where there is this gaping hole in the system when no, everybody says, I'm not responsible and I have no powers. Um, and I guess you're asking me really for a whole of government view, which I can't appropriately, appropriately give you. I certainly can't add to what the minister said in, in terms of that. All I can say is from the National Parks perspective, we'll do everything we can to minimise <coughs> the risk and to play our role within that bigger picture. Thank you. Um, I've got another question as well, just before I throw to anyone else. Um, it was, again, in ref um, reference to an answer that I had to a question on notice. Um, I think it was from the Minister rather than from you, but she, she included a table um, of the number of animals, uh, sorry, the number of horses um, that were killed either by ground or aerial shooting between the 4th of April and the 4th of July. Um, and at least the management area retention um, removal um, and it also includes the shooting method, whether it was ground or aerial. Um, so to give you an example, on the 8th of April, um, actually that's not a good example, um, on the 16th of April, there was 368 horses aerial shot and six ground shot. Are they separate programs or yes. is that a helicopter potentially landing and shooting further horses? Um, no, they're, they're separate programs. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, just a couple of questions from me, Mr Fleming. Um, just in relation to the uh, publishing submissions that were put in in relation to uh, the program for uh, Brumby culling that came in from the public, uh, why does the National Parks and Wildlife Service uh, actually publish those, make them available to the public, those submissions? Um, to be honest, I can't remember what we have done, so I'd have to take that on notice, but I can, I can give you a okay. response. Yeah. Because, because in the past too, you know, for example, when national parks have been reviewing the licensing programs, for, for example, for keeping native animals or taxidermy, I suppose, or native animals in birds, yeah. There have been a lot of submissions put in in those program, those program reviews as well, but equally National Parks hasn't uh, seen fit to publish them. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm happy to take it on notice because I'm just not off the top of my head. I don't know what the specific... Well, could you also take it on notice are. to explain why they wouldn't be published? Yep. Uh, because other departments and other parts of the government regularly publish uh, opinions and uh, people's submissions and... Uh, I think it'd be good from a PR point of view if National Parks and Wildlife Service did that as well. Sure. Thank you. No more questions. I'll just, okay, I'll just double check if the government's got any questions on Ms Boyd. Sorry. Ms Higginson? Um, no. Thank no? you. Okay. The Honourable West Fang, did you have a follow-up? Uh, no, I'm, I'm Pretty full bottle. Thank you very much Sorry, for, for will, coming in and yeah, actually providing some answers. I really clear one it. thing up. Um, Mr Fleming, I think that you said that um, <coughs> all of Kosciuszko is a sensitive place. Um, is that, um, it, was that your evidence? I was sort of a bit yes, no, no. perplexed Asleep? that we were... Yes. I mean, there is a lot of, there's, there's a lot of focus, say, for example, on threatened species habitat, but... Um, really, if you look at the threatened species habitat, that's right across the park. And then, of course, you need to look at the other values. So there's Aboriginal cultural values right right across the park. Um, there, are, there are threatened habitats, um, ecosystems, you know, endemic plants. Um, if you map all of those values, you see that the park both comes up as globally incredibly significant and it's hard to find a part of the park that's not really important. Uh, so um, really my point is that the benefits of reducing feral animal numbers, whether that's horses or, or deer or pigs, is partly about protecting those very sensitive areas or the areas that we readily identify as sensitive, but it's partly about reducing the pressure on the park as a whole and delivering an, an uplift in the ecological health of the, the entire park. Thank you. And is it the case that 
this is the only national park in the whole state that has some kind of law that provides some kind of protection for a feral species? Uh, it, to the best of my knowledge, I think that's probably accurate, yes. Uh, in, let me phrase it this way. It's the only park where I think we've got dedicated legislation for a particular feral uh, introduced non-native non species, yes. And just for the record, um, what's your current assessment of how much country within New South Wales is protected in a national park, the percentage of New South Wales? Uh, Too it's, much. it's approximately 10% of <laughs> New South Wales that is e either in gazetted national park or 10%. Um, uh, uh, being managed by waste. the National Parks and Wildlife Service. Too I think much. it's 10.4%. And um, and um, a, and what does the um, what does the high ambition coalition say about what is a good representation area of protect the, a protected area network now? Um, perhaps I should answer that by what, what area re the referencing the fact that the Australia Australian government has a commitment to thirty percent of Australia being managed for conservation, but each state's contribution will be different and depend on its particular <laughs> circumstances. Okay. And, um, and just one final thing for clarification, I think you identified or was intimating that it is not the role of the National Parks and Wildlife Service to be um, managing the welfare outcomes of horses once they are taken and placed in a domestic environment. Yeah, I mean, I think that was recognised in the report and it, it, our, our legislation doesn't give us mm. that capacity. and. I don't think um, private landholders want the National Parks and Wildlife Service to have power to enter their land to, to look at domestic animals effectively. But what we do need to do is, um, uh, and what we are doing is taking very seriously these recommendations because we need to improve some of our processes to make sure we're reducing the risk when we make decisions about who can be a rehomer, how many horses they can take, and obviously, um, if we do that and if we improve our engagement with other parts of government, then the risk that um, uh, the welfare risk generally is, is reduced. Thank you. I'll resist, to use, resist the urge to use the words iconic brumbies instead of feral horses in response to Ms Higginson. I've got brumbies, um, no horses. Can I just Love clarify on that last one? Love because the, the report does indicate Love that that it very well could happen again. Especially in the other. Can I just clarify that you recognise as well that um, given that there isn't really any mechanism for following up the uh, um, after the animals have been rehomed that this could actually happen again, the Wagga Wagga situation? Um, all I think I'm, it's, all I think it's reasonable for me to do is, is to acknowledge that the what's in the report, which is a concern that the risk can't be completely eliminated or that management, I mean, management of the risk involves a number of government agencies, one of which is national parks. So we'll yeah. obviously do everything we can. Yeah. Um, but um, Sorry, I don't think that the report says it can't be risked out. I think what the report is saying is that because there is no mechanism once the animals are rehomed to oversight that, that there's no way of ensuring that this won't happen again. Um, I'll let the report s speak for itself then. Um, uh, uh, all I can say is National Parks and Wildlife Service will do everything that we can to manage the risk and, and um, would that seek, seek to ensure it yeah. doesn't happen again. Would, that, um, but would that include advocating to the minister that you're given the statutory authority to oversight this once the animals are rehomed? Um, because obviously that would close the gap. No, but uh, as I said earlier, it would include us playing a really constructive role within a whole of government sort of approach. Okay, but you wouldn't advocate that parks are given the authority to close that gap? Um, on, I, I don't think that's the best way to solve the problem. What do, how do, you, what do you think is the best way to solve well, it? Um, and if, for us to play a constructive role within a whole of government approach.
for, for the government to give that authority to somebody else. As I else. said, I, you're, you're asking me to speak <laughs> outside of... You know, I, I can tell you what National Parks and Wildlife Service can do. I can't really go beyond that. And what I'm trying I to... I think, oh yeah, my original question was you. that you, you said that you were going to do whatever you could possibly do and I asked if yeah. you were going to advocate to the government and for that statutory authority and, and the answer is no. no. So yeah. you wouldn't be. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, thank you for your evidence today. Um, there was um, some questions taken on notice, um, which the Secretary will be um, in contact with you about, um, and there may be further questions on notice as well, but thank you for your time today and for giving your evidence. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.